Who are some of the more, let's just call them, interesting people we covered in 2023? Let's get right to it with this marathon video. Who are the people that we want to kick out of society? Let's find out, starting with... Number 7. Selena Powell Social media influencer Selena Powell received a two-year prison sentence when she violated the terms of her probation from an arrest for driving the getaway vehicle in a theft ring. Powell failed to comply with court-mandated substance tests and was arrested when she failed to show up for a court date. Powell rose to fame with her YouTube channel where she detailed her experiences with famous rap stars. Powell claimed to be the other woman in Snoop Dogg's marriage to his wife, accused Offset of impregnating her during an affair, alleged Trey Songz committed misconduct, and said that Drake changed his number when Powell wouldn't stop sending him explicit images of herself. She sounds like a real catch. Powell made several appearances on the popular No Jumper podcast where she talked about her affairs. But text messages between Powell and Drake surfaced online where Drake said he never gave the influencer his number and wanted nothing to do with her. Powell also later admitted to lying about being pregnant with Offset's child. Powell was eventually arrested for being the getaway driver of a theft ring and was sentenced to 24 months of probation. She had just one month to go before her probation ended, but rather than lay low and wait for it to be over, she violated its terms, resulting in her two-year prison sentence. Number 6. The Puncher Alfred Lewis, this teenager from Texas, admitted to randomly decking random people in public to gain social media attention. Surprise, surprise, more stupid people doing stupid things for the likes. The random crimes were videoed at Wortham Park in Houston and rightfully outraged among park visitors. Lewis confessed that he committed the crimes to get likes and views for his YouTube and TikTok channels. The video, which was shared on the Neighborhood Watch app next door, led to a police investigation. The victims in the video appeared startled but didn't fight back. Lewis's crimes are just one more part of the trend among teenagers who resort to being complete jerks just for the views. You'd think this sort of stuff would lead to a bigger discussion about how far we're willing to go for social media fame and who should be held responsible. Lewis said he didn't expect the situation to escalate as it did and emphasized that the video only showed the bad part of his actions and said that he shook hands and hugged the victims afterward. Which is hard to believe because why wouldn't you show that in your video too? Lewis also said that others shouldn't do the same things and seemed surprised by the harsh reaction to his video and made him think that maybe just randomly hitting people was not a good idea. We're supposed to be listening to this guy for advice? Lewis described the whole ordeal as a prank that got out of control and dismissed any responsibility by saying that everyone makes mistakes, which makes us also think he doesn't really know what words like prank mean, nor was he actually realizing that that wasn't something he should do. And the weirdest thing is that these likes aren't even real. Anyone watching that happen in person isn't going to be like, that's awesome, Alfred. Take that random guy out. Okay, well, maybe some people, but the number of people who liked the video and the number of those same people who would applaud him in person are not the same. Number five, the wheelchair bandits. A gang of robbers targeted a disabled man in a motorized wheelchair at a gas station in the Setagas district of Houston, Texas. The elderly victim was shopping at a convenience store when one of the robbers noticed him grabbing money out of his bag. Later, the suspect returned to the store's parking lot with two accomplices seemingly scanning the station forecourt for their vulnerable target. One of the assailants silently crept up behind the victim, grabbed the man's bag, and ran away. Houston police released the security footage, shedding light on the alarming increase in purse-snatching incidents in the city. Mayor Sylvester Turner expressed concern about the rise of crime in the city. In 2023, shoplifting is up 14.4%, pickpocketing is up 28.2%, and stolen property offenses is up a whopping 87.9% from 2022. So stay out of Houston for now, everyone. It's a cesspool of petty crime. This incident is just another example of this weird trend of 
going after disabled people and the elderly. Security footage captured a disabled woman being robbed in her wheelchair after withdrawing cash from an ATM. Also, a paraplegic man was still hit even after giving all of his money to a robber. In another incident, a would-be robber targeted a man in a wheelchair outside a metro station in Midtown, but the robber picked the wrong guy since the guy was armed. We're surprised that this doesn't happen more because it's Texas, right? Maybe it's the whole, if you know most people are armed, you're a lot more polite to them type of deal. But what we do know is that petty crime probably is not a good idea in a place where everyone's carrying. Number four, the stalker. A woman named Jessica Nordquist was sentenced to four and a half years in prison for her stalking campaign against her ex-boyfriend, Mark Weeks. The whole weird ordeal began after their relationship ended. Nordquist, for whatever reason, claimed she was pregnant because nothing fixes a messed up short-term relationship like a baby, right? She even bought a fake baby bump on Amazon to really make it look like she was. We're not sure what the end game here was since pregnancies aren't an indefinite thing. Apparently, neither did Nordquist since she also created fake email accounts, sending messages to Mark, alleging she had been kidnapped and that the kidnappers had their way with her. She then sent him photos of herself tied to a bed as evidence. Mark got the messages from anonymous numbers, stressing him out like crazy. Even if the breakup was ugly, you still don't want to see something bad happen to an ex. As things escalated, Mark said he started feeling unsafe in his own home, constantly on edge and always looking over his shoulder, fearing that someone might be watching him. The Relentless stalking tactics included Norquist setting up over 20 fake Instagram accounts to spread false claims about her ex-boyfriend. Norquist's elaborate scheme reached a peak when her kidnapping led to a nationwide search. She was eventually found safe in Scotland, further unraveling the web of lies she had woven. In court, Norquist was described as intelligent, resourceful, and well-educated, but with a troubling past that may have contributed to her behavior. Norquist was convicted of her charges, resulting in a total jail term of four and a half years. Of course, she was issued a restraining order preventing her from contacting her ex. Number three, the saboteur. Jennifer Ju Yen Lee was ordered to pay her ex-boyfriend, Eric Abramovitz, 375,000 Canadian dollars in compensation for sabotaging his clarinet career. Abramovitz, an accomplished clarinetist, had applied to complete his degree under Yehuda Gilad, a renowned clarinet professor at Colborn School in Los Angeles, a prestigious institution affiliated with the University of Southern California. Abramovitz and Lee had met at McGill University, where they were both music students. Abramovitz's relationship with Lee was great, until it took a weird and devastating turn when Lee intercepted an email from Colburn School offering Abramovitz a spot in the program with a full scholarship. Instead of letting Abramovitz know about the acceptance, she declined the offer on his behalf, claiming he would be studying elsewhere. Lee took it a step further and created a fake email account in Gilad's name to send Abramovitz a modified offer purportedly from Gilad himself. This fake email offered Abramovitz a spot at USC but with a minimal scholarship of $5,000 and he would have to cover tuition fees of approximately $46,000 and living expenses, a financial burden he couldn't afford. Abramovitz was completely unaware of Lee's scheme, thinking he had been rejected from Colburn School. As a result, he missed out on a unique opportunity to study under Gilad, a setback that profoundly impacted his career. Eventually, Abramovitz learned about Lee's deception when he had a strange encounter with Gilad during another audition. Gilad asked Abramovitz why he rejected the offer, confusing Abramovitz. So he decides to investigate further, finding out what Lee did. Feeling betrayed and robbed of a significant chance to advance his musical career, Abramovitz took his ex to court. The damages awarded to Abramovitz covered the loss of educational opportunity and income resulting from Lee being selfish and weird. Whether or not she actually paid it is a whole other story. To be honest, it seems a bit of a low amount to us. Let us know what you think in the comment section. Number two, Miss Unaccountable. Daniela Lease, a Canadian woman, went to a Marilyn Manson concert at the Budweiser Gardens Arena in London, Ontario. After drinking too much at the concert, she got behind the wheel of her father's Ford Fusion. While driving home, Lease crashed into a brick house, rupturing a gas line in the process. The impact triggered a massive explosion, destroying not only the house she crashed into, but also causing extensive damage to three neighboring homes. The resulting explosion and subsequent fires led to injuries for seven people, including two police officers 
officers and two firefighters. The financial impact of the incident has been significant, with numerous people suffering injuries and extensive property damage. The total damages caused by the explosion were estimated to be between 9.8 $14.7 million. One firefighter had to spend more than a week in the hospital due to injuries sustained during the response. Daniela Lise pleaded guilty to four counts of impaired driving, leading to her receiving a three-year prison sentence. Despite her conviction, Daniela and her father, Sean Lease, filed a lawsuit against Ovation's Ontario Food Services, the company responsible for distributing alcohol at the concert venue. Why? Because the company, who was serving all the people at the concert, were somehow responsible. In their lawsuit, the Lease family alleges that Ovation's Ontario Food Services shares liability for the explosion. They said that the venue staff failed to prevent Daniela from driving home while intoxicated. She was old enough to drink, not be responsible, you know? Those are two different things. Her being responsible for herself was Ovation's job, obviously. The bar's employees allegedly ejected Lise from the venue without making sure she wouldn't drive in the state she was in, which was apparently drunk. The lawsuit further accuses Ovation's of serving alcohol to Lise despite being aware of her intoxication, prioritizing profit over safety. The Lise family says that Ovation's negligence and breach of duty contributed to the explosion and its aftermath. As part of their claim, they said that the liquor distributor should be held responsible for any awards or judgments resulting from the multiple court claims filed against them by the victims of the incident. If required to pay any amount, the Lease family believes they're entitled to contribution and indemnity from Ovation's Ontario Food Services. At what point does Danielle Lee stop thinking that everyone should have to babysit her? It's possible that she was overserved, but at a venue like that, it's difficult to expect the people serving beer to be able to take the time to check on her. No one is responsible for you other than you. At the end of the day, we're just glad no one lost their lives. Number one, the purse. In Perth, Australia, a pregnant mother of twins was just going about her day when a 15-year-old girl, whose name we don't have because of her age, decided she wanted the mom's purse. Pregnant mom was walking and minding her own business when the teenager, who was riding a scooter, came from behind and went to town on the mom. Poor lady fell to the ground and desperately tried to hold on to her stroller, but it toppled over during her incident, leaving her young twins completely exposed. The incident was all captured on video, and despite the mother's efforts to protect her kids, the teenager continued. The CCTV footage was shared on social media, and reasonable thinking people were pretty upset about it. But there's a good part about everything being caught on video and being shared on social media. The police were able to find and arrest the teenager and charged her with robbery thanks to the footage. Video before the incident showed the teenager riding a scooter down the sidewalk behind another girl. The other girl was also arrested as part of the early investigation, but wasn't charged. Thankfully, the mom ended up with only a few cuts and bruises. And why did all this happened because the girl wanted her purse. There's footage of the girl getting arrested too, her acting like an idiot while her family is crying in the background. As far as we know, the children, the unborn baby, and the mom are doing okay. And it's bad enough that this even happened, but the lady was literally pushing a stroller. Clearly, there's stuff going on with that girl, and hopefully this is a wake-up call to figure out whatever is wrong. Who are some of the people who've completely lied about themselves? Let's get going with... Number 5. Identity Crisis In 2017, Victoria Waldrop, a Georgia teenager known online for her prank videos as Whoa Vicky, came under fire. She was claiming that despite her blonde hair and light skin, she is actually black. She said she took a DNA test to prove what she always believed about her heritage. Even though both of her parents present as white, Vicky claims her black heritage comes from her dad, who never knew he was actually mixed race. Since announcing her African-American lineage, Whoa Vicky started posting pictures and videos online, adopting a new accent, using the N-word, wearing grills, do-rags, and bonnets. She also started twerking and fighting. This behavior earned her 600 thousand Instagram followers. In one of her viral videos, Woe Vicky admitted that her mother always told her that she's white, but she refused to believe it for whatever reason. She decided to use the day she received her DNA results confirming her black identity as her new birthday. She posted a makeup tutorial on YouTube for black women and promoted products encouraging brands to sponsor her. As if her story couldn't get more outlandish, 
Whoa, Vicky also claimed she was pregnant with twins. When people confronted her about lying about her identity, Vicky responded by calling her followers racist. She posted a DNA test that said she was 45% black and 54% European, even though she initially said she was only 25% black. Vicky never came up with a good reason for the difference between her initial claims and the actual DNA results. Celebrities like Snoop Dogg and Plies shared her videos as funny entertainment, but many people didn't find her behavior to be a laughing matter. In 2018, a year after coming out as black, Vicky was arrested at a mall in Greensboro, North Carolina for kicking a police officer. Mall security and police gave her several opportunities to leave the mall but she refused. The man who was with Vicky started shouting and another person yelled that there was an active shooter present. She was charged with trespassing, hitting a law enforcement officer, and resisting arrest. Vicky was listed as white on the police report but claimed that police were being racist against her and, and even used the Black Lives Matter hashtag on an Instagram post explaining the incident. She posted a video of her arrest on Instagram along with her mugshot and the hashtag Free Vicky. In 2023, Whoa Vicky still stirring up controversy online. She still wears cornrows and appropriates black culture. In one video, she praised Jeffrey Dahmer, and in another video, spoke negatively about the LGBTQ community. Vicky used her platform to try to enter the entertainment world, releasing songs called Cash App and In Da City, both rap and hip-hop tracks. She still has more than 3 million Instagram followers, and following the celebrity skincare trend, started her own skincare line called Woe Skin. Another controversy from Woe Vicky is perhaps her high-profile beef with Bad Baby, though Vicky said it was all just a joke to her. And really, that was a hard beef, because who are you going to side with, you know? Both of these young ladies are such beacons of light, it was nearly impossible to pick a side. It's like you have to choose between mom and dad or something. It was a horrible situation for us, so thank God it's over. Number four, the cartel CEO. Marty Tibbetts was a Michigan millionaire and CEO of Clementine Live Answering Service. But the DEA said he wasn't as much of a CEO as he was someone that needed to be enforced by their agency. He used the alias Dale Johnson to fund a global cartel and designed submarines to bypass authorities in Europe. Federal authorities exposed Tibbetts' double life after arresting his partner in crime, Lee Didani, who was wanted for things the DEA doesn't like, such as contraband, firearms, and narco submarines. The investigation the investigation revealed that Tibbetts' cartel spanned three continents and 15 countries. Authorities arrested Didani and searched his phone, in which they found pictures of him posing with guns and stacks of cash, because if you have both, you have to take pictures like that. It's the law! In addition to conversations with Tibbetts about fraudulent passports, contraband sales, and money laundering, Tibbetts also apparently worked with fellow cartels to create a parasitic narco submarine called the Torpedo, which would attach itself to the hull of a larger ship via a large magnet, which is admittedly super cool. The submarine could be manipulated by a remote control and a fishing boat could approach the boat to retrieve the contraband and take them to shore. They built a submarine prototype in 2018, but the operation never came to fruition. Tibbetts passed away when his vintage fighter jet crashed into a Wisconsin dairy farm in July 2018, incinerating 50 cows. Authorities arrested Dadani two years later in North Carolina on charges of conspiracy to distribute controlled substances and money laundering. Tibbetts began his partnership with Dadani in 2015, giving him $1.8 million to fund his illegal activities. Over the years, Tibbetts transferred millions more to Dadani. They raised $12,000 in funding in crypto and an Albanian bank account to pay for development of the submarine, even though the manufacturer didn't know the sub's true purpose. When Tibbetts passed away, so did his plans for the narco submarine. Dadani could no longer find enough funding for his cartel and relied on a sponsor in the United Arab Emirates. But in 2020, authorities seized hundreds of kilograms of what we call nose beer in the Netherlands, leading to the ultimate downfall of his empire. Authorities looked through Dadani's luggage and found controlled substances. When neighbors learned of Tibbet's side hustle as an international dealer, they were shocked. He founded the World Heritage Aviation Museum in Detroit and is survived by his wife and two children. His neighbors and friends called him a joy and a business visionary. And seriously, whatever happened to the torpedo sub? It sounds awesome. And we got a pool. Just saying. Number three, not your accent. 
Spaniard Hilaria Baldwin, a former model famous for being Alec Baldwin's wife and baby mama, had to eventually admit that her name isn't Hilaria, and she isn't from Spain. When someone called her out on the brewing conspiracy that she was impersonating a Spanish accent, Hilaria posted on Instagram and admitted her true identity. Her agency's website claimed that Hilaria was born in Mallorca, Spain, and was raised in Boston. She said she was raising her children with her native language, Spanish. Hilaria was known for using a pronounced Spanish accent in media appearances. On a TV cooking show, Hilaria even claimed to forget the English word for cucumber because she's just so Spanish. But Hilaria confused fans when her American accent came through on Instagram when responding to Amy Schumer, who called out Hilaria's suspiciously in-shape body after just giving birth. So there's yet another Hilaria Baldwin conspiracy theory. Internet investigators with more time than sense eventually uncovered that Hilaria's real name is Hillary Hayward Thomas, and she grew up in Massachusetts with no Spanish ancestry. Even though she's a confirmed alum of a high school in Weston, Massachusetts, Hilaria claimed that she moved to the U.S. from Spain when she was 19 to attend NYU. Her parents, though, do live in Mallorca and left the U.S. in 2011, so it's like she's practically from there. After the accusations about her fake identity came to light, Hilaria took to Instagram to clarify things. She said that she was born in Boston, but spent her childhood going between Spain and the U.S. She said she grew up bilingual and wanted her kids to be raised similarly. She also said she used the name Hilaria when she would visit Spain and the name Hillary when in the U.S. So, when she met and married Alec Baldwin and came into the limelight, she decided to just go by her Spanish name to make things easier. We're not sure what she means by that, though. Even though she was born and raised in Boston, Hilaria claims that her fluctuating Spanish accent represents the two cultures in which she grew up. She says that sometimes her accent changes depending on if she's been speaking more Spanish or English recently, and accidentally mixes the two languages when she's feeling flustered. Hilaria said she prides herself on being authentic and wants to claim both her Spanish and American identities. Honestly, we always thought the Boston accent was wicked cool, so it's a shame she cast it aside to appropriate Spanish culture. Hey, Hilaria, where's the babla? Let's go to the packy and get some tonic. Go pack the car. Number two, Samantha who? Samantha Lindell as a party is an international con woman who invented fake identities to swindle wealthy Australian families and government authorities through an au pair scam. An au pair is a live-in helper from a foreign country, kind of like a nanny or butler. We had to look that up for the record. As a party conned Melbourne family Tom and Jazz Jervis into believing that she was an experienced au pair named Harper Hernandez. She claimed to be from a rich American family and was paid $6,500 in six months by working for the Jervis family. As a party, duped another Melbourne couple when she said she was an au pair named Saka. As a party conned yet another family when she said she was a talent recruiter named Marley and took their child to Sydney. Foreign governments have also fallen victim to as a party scams. In 2013, she went to Dublin and claimed to be seeking refuge after being involved in human trafficking in Eastern Europe. The Irish government spent hundreds of thousands of dollars until her lies were exposed. She was then deported to Canada where she started even more lies. Back in Australia, she told a family in Perth that she was a Russian gymnast named Emily. Other people saw her in Sydney, claiming to be a schoolgirl half her age. In August 2022, as a party told non-profit organization Jewish Care in Australia that she was a 14-year-old French survivor of human trafficking. She said she had arrived in Australia, desperately seeking a foster family to take her in after fleeing her home country of France. When police questioned her, as a party tried to run away, but eventually told police that an Australian couple had been taking care of her for the last five weeks. When police tried to find her, this foster family, she sent them to a slew of fake addresses. In French-twinged broken English, she then told authorities she was lost. Investigators found out that her foster family's names were completely made up, and any messages exchanged between them and Jewish care were probably sent by Azapardi herself. After a nine-hour interrogation and fingerprint analysis, police discovered that she was an international con artist who had used more than 40 fake identities. Azapardi didn't appear in court, so her lawyer pleaded guilty on her behalf to making a false representation to police that she was the victim. She claims to be dealing with a variety of mental health issues, including borderline personality disorder. As a party has also been diagnosed with Pseudologia Fantastica, a condition which presents itself as compulsive pathological lying. Number one, Rachel Dolezal. 
In 2015, Rachel Dolezal, the famed president of the NAACP in Washington, was revealed to be faking the black identity she had been claiming. Her white parents came forward with her birth certificate and childhood photos of Dolezal with blonde hair and green eyes. They insisted that their lineage is purely European and there's no evidence of African heritage at all. When a reporter confronted Dolezal about her racial identity, she dodged the question and continued to do so whenever the news approached her. Dolezal has been transforming her appearance to look African-American for 20 years. When Dolezal was a teenager, her family adopted four black kids and she became fascinated with their culture. She started using hair extensions and even tried to grow an afro. She changed her accent and in college, created her undergraduate portfolio of African American art. This earned her a full ride to the historically black Howard University for a master's in fine arts. By the time Dolezal moved to Spokane, Washington with her young son Franklin, she perfected her look. She was elected president of the local NAACP and criticized America's white power structure. She said that her father was just her stepfather and posted a picture of herself hugging a black man on Facebook who she claimed was her real father. Dolezal said she has been a victim of several hate crimes over the years, such as receiving a bundle of racist letters and pictures in her mailbox. Police had investigated the letters and Dolezal had to deny planting them there herself because she probably did. In 2020, Dolezal joined the platform Cameo, where she offered fans personalized video messages for $37 each, or they could message her for only $2.99. Some of her videos include birthday and congratulation messages. Almost 10 years after her true racial identity was revealed, Dolezal still insists she's black and has been unable to land a job because of her scandalous past. To make ends meet, besides selling videos on Cameo, Dolezal sells her art online. Unsurprisingly, most of her work is centered on race. She also sells her memoir in full color on her website. Dolezal continues to whine about not being able to get a job, including positions that don't require a degree, like being a maid at a hotel. Out of apparent desperation, she joined ahem, OnlyFans in 2020 and sold scandalous photos to anyone who paid for them. But in September 2021, several explicit photos of Dolezal were leaked on social media. Apparently, the series of photos were an ode to Rihanna's Savage X Fenty lingerie line. Fans can access her content for $9.99 a month. Dolezal also said she would start selling foot pictures and fitness tips. Dolezal promised new content three times per week. This isn't her only side hustle. Dolezal previously tried to sell homemade lollipops pops, melanin spectrum dolls, and a sculpture of an electric chair. Yeah. The Southampton Soccer Club didn't know much about Nile Rangers' checkered past, so the academy director was shocked when the club got a letter from the Crown Prosecution Service ordering a 15-year-old Nile Ranger to stand trial over armed robbery. The club talked to the judge about his talent and how he had begun to mend his ways, but the damage had already been done. Ranger was sentenced to four months in a young offender institution, which is basically prison for minors. When receiving his sentence, Niall nearly passed out and cried as he heard his aunt sobbing behind him. Her son, Michael, was joining him behind bars, and the two were gonna be locked up for 23 hours a day. This was only the start of Niall Ranger's long rap sheet. Niall Ranger was once a successful Premier League soccer player, but his criminal behavior and legal issues destroyed his career and reputation. The South End United player had a string of criminal convictions, including street robbery, fighting police officers, and criminal damage, but always found a way to avoid jail time. That was until 2017, when he pleaded guilty to online banking fraud and confessed to charges of conspiracy to defraud by obtaining bank details and transferring money. After years of teachers, coaches, teammates, and fans giving him chance after chance, Ranger had nowhere to hide, and it was time to face some consequences. According to a personal essay by Ranger, published on 442's website, he was always in trouble growing up. He cursed at teachers and fought with the other kids during recess. By the time he reached fifth grade, Ranger was expelled from school for hitting a teacher with a lunch tray, which almost broke one of her hands. For an obviously angry kid, it could have been worse if he didn't have soccer as his outlet. Ranger was only 10 years old when he was signed by Crystal Palace, a professional soccer team, and spent two years with the club before they released him for his bad behavior at school. Without soccer to fill his time, Ranger grew restless and turned to theft. While he was in sixth grade, he stole other students' cell phones and sold them to a group of Albanian men in a local park. For Ranger, the money was rolling in. 
both from him selling the stolen phones and using his allowance from his mom to feed his growing gambling habit. When Ranger turned 13, his teachers asked his mom to sit in the back of the classroom to try to fix his bad behavior, but it didn't work. Then in eighth grade, he was expelled again, this time for messing with his classmates with a Bunsen burner. Ranger's only option was to enroll in the Octagon, a school for kids with learning difficulties or behavioral problems. Although Ranger's life off the soccer pitch was tumultuous, it was a different story when he was on the pitch. Soccer gave him something to strive for and be proud of, and he joined Heron G. Burrow, a semi-professional team. Playing for the team gave him a place to channel his energy, but he couldn't stop mixing with a bad crowd. Ranger was among a group of boys that robbed a nearby high school. He was arrested, put on seven months of probation, and given a curfew. But the curfew didn't slow him down. He repeatedly broke it to rob more houses. So his mom reported him to the police, and he was fitted with an ankle monitor. Ranger still found a way to sneak out when he discovered that he could use dish soap to remove the device, creating the illusion that he was still at home while roaming the streets. However, the trouble off the field was matched by his success on the field as his soccer career flourished. He joined Romford FC, another semi-professional club, and enrolled at a soccer academy run by Danny Shitu, a former professional soccer player. When he wasn't training, Ranger was gambling, stealing, or smoking a particular type of green plant. Not long into his time at Romford, Ranger was caught red-handed stealing his teammate's cell phone in the locker room. Shitu found the phones in Ranger's bag and confronted him, asking how they got in the soon-to-be professional player's backpack. Although Ranger denied stealing the phones, Shitu didn't believe him and banned Ranger from the academy. He might have been more upset if it wasn't for the fact that his earlier burglary charges were dropped around the same time. But rather than lay low, Ranger celebrated the charges being dropped by hopping on a bus and stealing more phones. Like you do. Once they finished on one bus, they jumped onto another and did the same thing. The crew had a massive stack of phones, but decided they needed even more and ran down a street, snatching people's cells from their hands. When a police car raced towards them, the guys panicked and ran away, throwing their massive haul into nearby bushes. Officers found the gang's stash and arrested Ranger for armed robbery. He was released on bail, but not even facing serious jail time could stop him from resisting the temptation to keep stealing. Ranger continued breaking his curfew, and when law enforcement found a stolen iPod in his possession, they arrested him again. Ranger's mom, who was at her wit's end, was ready to throw him out, but he begged for another chance. So she sent him to a soccer academy at Southgate College, which had connections with professional clubs, hoping he would straighten out. Ranger's talent on the field was undeniable. After he scored twice during a preseason match, winning his team the game, his coach received a call from Southampton FC, who were impressed by Ranger's performance. So he trained with Southampton's youth team, and within days, they offered him a two-year scholarship. The club covered his accommodations and paid him $135 a week. Although he was far from the temptations of his old life, he still snuck out of his housing at night to go clubbing, forcing his landlord to report his actions to the club. Southampton was unaware of Ranger's past, and minus finding him for sneaking out, they had no reason to believe he was in trouble. Then, the academy director received a letter from the Crown Prosecution Service with Ranger's court date for his trial over the armed robbery charges. Ranger's soccer career went on pause when he was sentenced to four months in a juvenile detention center. He was released two months into his sentence and returned to Southampton. This time, he lived in an apartment with his mother so she could keep him in line. Ranger had a promising return to the sport, but again, couldn't stop himself from stealing other people's things. He stole other players' cleats, a staff member's box of chocolates, and a training kit. He hid them in a bush with plans to take them to London, but a coach found them. Ranger begged for a second chance, but the team's manager kicked him out of the club. However, sports agents weren't concerned about how his time at Southampton ended and flooded him with offers. He received an exciting offer from Swindon, but his agent asked to meet him at a nearby Burger King. Newcastle wanted to sign Ranger and would pay him three times what Swindon was offering, plus a sign-on fee. Although the offer was enticing, Ranger wasn't sure if he wanted to be that far away from home. He 
Eventually, Newcastle's executive director convinced him to take the deal. Rangers stayed at the team accommodations and followed a strict routine, which gave him some much needed structure. Months after Rangers' time in prison, he was on the bench of a Premier League game against Arsenal. Ranger traveled by private jet with the soccer elite. At the end of his contract, the club rewarded him with a three and a half year deal worth $12,000 a week and bonuses for scoring goals and making appearances. He played in his first match in August 2009, but didn't score a goal until December of that year. Ranger enjoyed staying up late to go clubbing and spent most of his free time in casinos. He struggled to turn up to training on time, resulting in friction between him and the club's manager, Chris Hewton. Ranger gambled away $36,000 in two months and borrowed another 85,000 bucks from his teammates. When the club found out, they banned him from every casino in Newcastle and warned him of the dangers of gambling. When Ranger received a $115,000 bonus, he spent most of it on a new Range Rover despite his teammates driving old, beat-up cars. He ignored the people around him who advised him against elaborate purchases and not letting the success get to his head. Ranger's behavior off the pitch was an inconvenience to the club, but his performance outshone any issues he caused, at least for a while. In 2010, a club official pulled him aside to let him know that several tabloid newspapers were going to print a picture of him holding a gun. The image was his WhatsApp profile picture, and the club responded by fining him two weeks of pay. But then, three months later, Newcastle handed him a five-year contract. So Ranger thanked the club by driving under the influence during a midweek night out. Ranger was driving his girlfriend home when the police pulled him over and breathalyzed him. He was over the legal limit and spent the night locked in a cell. Ranger received a $3,600 fine and was banned from driving for a year. Around that time, Newcastle got a new manager, Alan Pardew, who walked in already sick of Ranger's behavior. After things already weren't going great with Pardew, Ranger ended up in court again. He got into a fight with two guys after some words were exchanged, and of course, the cops came. The police attempted to arrest Ranger for the incident, causing him to panic and shove them away. So, boom, he was then charged for fighting both men and the police officer. He pleaded guilty, but luckily, security camera footage supported his version of events, and he was cleared of all charges. Then Ranger was arrested again in January 2013 on suspicions of an assault on a woman after a night out. Ranger insisted that it was nothing more than a one-night stand, but the dire accusation was made. Newcastle canceled his contract. Teams weren't as forgiving of Ranger's behavior this time, with few wanting to be associated with the disgraced player. He spent five months as a free agent before signing a 12-month deal with Swindon for a quarter of his salary at Newcastle. He performed well when he turned up for training, but was frequently late and sometimes completely absent. Ranger was cleared of the charges, but had little time to celebrate as he was soon behind bars again for hitting a female friend when he was drunk. Although she didn't press charges, Ranger received a fine for property damage as he kicked the door of his apartment that night when he lost his keys. Swindon terminated his contract and he moved on to Blackpool, a town known for partying and gambling. So. A good move on that one. Although he made barely any money compared to earlier in his career, he was desperate. When the squad left Ranger out of a home game, he decided to go home to London and stayed there for six months. The club fined him for every game he missed, but he didn't care and was shocked when they extended his contract anyway. He turned up four weeks late and they made him train alone. Ranger apologized publicly for his behavior, but the club released him in February 2016. His next move was to South End where his biggest scandal came to light. In February 2015, Ranger conspired to use a woman named Diane Bloss's bank information and move $2,500 from one account to another. He obtained the details of Bloss's online HSBC account and used them to transfer money into a Santander account. The crime had two facets, acquiring the details for the fraud and what happened with the money when it was transferred. Although Ranger pleaded guilty to conspiracy to defraud, he pleaded not guilty to a separate money laundering charge. Ranger was found guilty and was sentenced to eight months in jail. After 10 weeks behind bars, he was released for good behavior, but had to wear an ankle monitor for five weeks and had a 7 p.m. curfew, meaning he couldn't play evening games. 
South End stuck by Ranger, and he played 21 times during the first half of the 2017-2018 season, but the club decided to terminate his contract due to his constant lateness. Ranger trained with Oxford in 2018, but refused a contract because he didn't like the terms. Another club, Rochdale, offered him $1,220 a week, but since the club wanted him to live with a teammate and his girlfriend to make sure he didn't fall back into his old habits, he turned down the offer as well. Instead, he moved home to live with his mom and played five aside several times a week to stay fit. A far cry from his days in the Premier League. According to his essay on 442's website, posted in February 2023, he hopes and prays for one last chance. With him burning so many bridges, the question is, who will give it to him? Nile Ranger's story shows the problems that come from sports teams excusing too much bad behavior just because someone's good at a game. For some people, sports is an outlet and a way out of a bad situation. With a lot of luck and the right amount of work, many have been able to lift themselves and their families out of poverty, and we can all agree that this is good. But problems come when old habits follow and were quick to forgive bad behavior. Would Niall have been better off if he never got all the extra chances he did? It's hard to say where he would have ended up or what his life would have been like, so we have no way of knowing. But because Niall was good at kicking a soccer ball, he was forgiven repeatedly, given chances he wouldn't have otherwise gotten, and was able to squander more opportunities than most of us will ever even get. Niall is just another casualty chewed up and spat out by the sports industry. If he had continued to be great, or had shown up to a few more practices, he'd still be awarded contracts. When he can't play well anymore, he's tossed aside with all his problems for the next big thing that has less problems and the machine moves on. Ultimately, the lesson here is that really, people, like these sports teams, don't really care about anything other than what you can do for them. Nile Ranger could get fans and seats by helping his club win games. Making the owners rich, they didn't care about his mile-long rap sheet until it became a PR issue. Ultimately, of course, Ranger is the one who's accountable, as he's the only one that's going to have to pay for the consequences. Who are the socialites and celebrities that make the dumbest decisions? Let's find out, starting with... Number 5. The Cleanest Cash Ex-glamour model Joe Emma Larvin and her partner Jonathan Johnson helped launder money from the UK to Dubai through a series of flights from Heathrow Airport. Abdullah al Falasi, the mastermind behind the operation, arranged 83 successful trips over 18 months. Michelle Clark, a mother of two, recruited couriers using a WhatsApp chat group titled Sunshine and Lollipops. She used the group to facilitate communication with the participants and plan the logistics of the trips. They hid bundles of millions of pounds of cash in their luggage and flew from Heathrow Airport to Dubai. They flew in business class to have extra luggage space and would present a letter from a company called Omnivest to customs in Dubai as a declaration for the cash. When they arrived, they'd hand over the money to local operatives and that was that. Each suitcase contained around 638 $8,000, which was vacuum packed and sprayed with coffee or air fresheners to confuse detection dogs. After delivering the cash, the couriers returned to the UK where they received payment for their involvement. The people overseeing the operation covered all of their expenses in Dubai, such as their accommodations, and when the couriers returned home, they received $3,800 for the job. The operation moved around $127 million out of the UK over the 83 trips. Before she was a money mule, Joe Emma Larvin led a glamour lifestyle. She had some degree of success as a glamour model, had some celebrity connections, and dreamed of having a successful acting career. Larvin carried millions of dollars in cash alongside other money mules, using typical vacation travel items to disguise the vast amount of cash she stashed in her suitcase. The police discovered messages where Larvin expressed her fear of getting caught and going to jail. Larvin and Johnson were arrested at Manchester Airport and charged with removing criminal property from the UK. Along with two other couriers, Larvin and Johnson were found guilty of knowingly or suspiciously removing cash that was believed to be the result of criminal activity. A fifth defendant was cleared of the charges. The ringleader, Al Falasi, was sentenced to nine years in prison. Don't lose hope, Joemma. Being a mule worked out for Tim Allen, so there's hope. Number four, the dirtiest vodka. 
British-born Johnny Morrissey was a key member of the Kinahan Cartel, where he worked as an enforcer and money launderer who got himself arrested. The Kinahan Cartel had a reputation for its conflicts, particularly its feud with the rival Hutch Gang. The tension between the two criminal organizations often resulted in conflicts across Ireland and Spain. Additionally, the Kinahan Cartel has also been involved in other criminal activities, such as contraband trafficking, money laundering, and other illicit enterprises. The Spanish Civil Guard's elite UCO unit worked with Garda, the UK's national crime agency, and the US DEA law enforcement agency to track down Morrissey. Then it took detectives from six different police forces working together finally bring him down. In the meantime, Morrissey enjoyed a lavish lifestyle and spent his time mingling with celebrities. He lived with his wife, Nicola, in an extravagant $6.4 million villa that had numerous bedrooms, a swimming pool, and an outdoor sauna near Marbella, Spain. The place was so over the top that when they were out of town, the couple rented their home to vacationers for up to $6,500 a week. Morrissey also loved expensive cars and had a collection that included an armored vehicle and a convertible Rolls Royce. The couple also owned the Nero Premium Vodka Company, where Nicola was the CEO and Johnny served as an ambassador. Morrissey often took photos with British reality TV stars and soap opera actors to promote the couple's vodka. Many celebrities endorsed the brand, but it was later linked by police to money laundering on behalf of the Kennedy hand cartel. Originally from Manchester, England, Morrissey moved to Costa del Sol, Spain, where his role in the Kinahan cartel grew. Morrissey's role was to facilitate international shipments from South America and orchestrated money laundering operation. Morrissey also grew close to the cartel's boss, Daniel Kinahan, and attended his wedding in Dubai in the summer of 2017. While he enjoyed a glamorous life behind the scenes, Morrissey was associated with 38 people who met their demise. Over the course of 18 months, he also played a key role in laundering $188 million for the Kinahan cartel. Authorities believe that the Nero Premium Vodka Company was actually a front for the money laundering operation. Despite its celebrity endorsements and appearances, the company was losing $382,365 over the course of a year. So obviously, something was up. The Spanish Civil Guard arrested the couple at their home and took them into custody. Authorities feared Morrissey would attempt to flee the country, so they didn't grant him bail. Morrissey could spend up to four years years behind bars without a charge unless his legal team can convince a judge that he isn't a flight risk and should be granted bail conditions. Which, in other words, means he's uh, not going anywhere. And if that wasn't bad enough, apparently the vodka wasn't good either. Number three, orange is the new black. Catherine Lee, a successful jewelry designer and socialite from Houston, was also caught running an illegal gambling operation in her house. Along with her husband and five others, Lee helped run game rooms where they knowingly acquired, concealed, transported, and possessed funds of at least $300,000. Lee had a successful career designing jewelry and creating pieces that were sold at luxury department stores like Neyman Marcus. The fact that she had a bit of success designing jewelry makes the decision to run a gambling room a bit odd. Lee married a guy named Hao Nguyen in 2006, and they took inspiration from the lavish wedding of Donald and Melania Trump. The affluent couple threw an even more extravagant event than the Trumps, with an additional 200 guests attending their celebration than the former first couples. The event was so over the top that it was featured in People magazine and on E! News, where they were described as out-trumping the Trumps. Lee was even included in the Houston Chronicle's best dress list in 2010. Lee's extravagant wedding earned her a good amount of status in the high society circle she was in. So why she'd risk all of that is anyone's guess. Lee's social status changed dramatically when she was arrested in connection with the money laundering operation. Six individuals allegedly ran three game rooms where they were making tons of money. Lee would launder the money by depositing it in multiple accounts where it was then turned into gold and money orders or other easily sold items. Authorities have been watching the group for about two years and said that the group brought in over $5 million. And they didn't pay any taxes. None. Lee has been charged with money laundering and her bond was set at $150,000. Thank goodness we got those low down money laundering gamblers off the streets of Houston, right? Everyone who lives in those gated communities probably feel much safer now. Number two, the life of the parties. Australian socialite Lisa Stockbridge orchestrated a sophisticated dealing operation that landed her in jail. Despite her image as a lifestyle blogger and public relations executive, Stockbridge supported herself and her business by selling illegal substances to Sydney's elite from her black Range Rover. She decided to venture into dealing due to her blog, 
Urban Society that once employed 12 people but was then struggling to stay afloat. Stockbridge's public relations job had over 200 clients across central and eastern Sydney, so she was doing okay with that, but apparently not where she wanted to be. Although the original plan was to make enough money to support her failing blog, but when Stockbridge learned how much money she could make dealing, she also used her profits to pay the $2,150 a night rent at her apartment. And yes, you heard that right. Who pays that much a night for an apartment though? Somehow detectives grew suspicious of her and installed bugs in her car, tracked her movements, and watched her perform transactions. They executed a search warrant in her insanely expensive apartment and found a large amount of contraband, 10 cell phones, $33,000 in cash, and other small amounts of contraband in her closet. Stockbridge entered police custody where she got into a fight with another inmate after a rumor spread that she was an undercover police officer. Although law enforcement classified her operation as sophisticated, Stockbridge claimed her activities weren't as intricate as they were made out to be. She made a Facebook post where she mocked the notion that her operation was complex, saying that it would be difficult to run a sophisticated operation from your car. The former socialite pleaded guilty to two contraband related charges. During her sentencing hearing, she mentioned suffering medical issues during her previous time in custody due to the lack of fresh produce, which aggravated her food intolerances. Number one, Logan Paul. Boxer, wrestler, and YouTube star, Logan Paul defrauded investors out of millions of dollars as part of an NFT scam that he may not have meant to be a scam. Paul is no stranger to controversy. He has promoted UFO videos on his social media channels and endorsed the energy drink Prime, which Senator Chuck Schumer has called on the FDA to investigate. When he visited Japan's famous Aokigahara Forest, known as a place people go to take their own lives, Paul posted a video of a hanging body Body for views. He then enraged PETA, not exactly a feat, when he shared videos where he tasered two rats and attempted CPR on a koi fish. In 2021, he announced his animated NFT project inspired by Pokemon called CryptoZoo, which he marketed as a really fun way to make money. Users could pay $1,000 for the chance to breed, collect, and trade exotic hybrid animals on the blockchain. The rarer the animal, the more zoo tokens, the in-game currency, users earned. The game was never made, but the first 10,000 NFTs immediately sold out. Paul unveiled a recovery plan for angry investors as the game became Vaporwire. He planned to offer a rewards program for players who were disappointed in the game's status and promised that it would get finished. The $1.5 million plan didn't impress those investors who filed a class action lawsuit against CryptoZoo and Paul. They claimed that the influencer and members of the CryptoZoo team just stole millions of dollars instead. The lawsuit claimed that Paul and others that worked at CryptoZoo didn't invest the time and effort to create a functional game or support it and instead actually developed a scheme to defraud investors. Stephen Coffeezilla Findison, who investigates online scams for a living, helped provide investors with the information they needed for the lawsuit. Findison had researched CryptoZoo for over a year and published a three-part series on YouTube in December 2022 where he explained the ways the NFT project had failed its investors and interviewed dozens of individuals who lost money. One man lost $335,000 thousand dollars to the business venture. Findison appeared on the Joe Rogan Experience podcast to discuss his research and estimated that tens of thousands of victims existed. According to his calculations, Paul owed over $3.6 million. Additionally, CryptoZoo's chief engineer, Zach Kelling, stated publicly that Paul owed him at least $1 million for his work. Paul attempted to blame Kelling for the failure, posting a video on YouTube after refusing to pay Kelling's team and blacklisting all of their tokens. The video caused Kelling's family to receive threats. So Paul took down the video, but the situation still caused massive issues for Kelling's life and career, harming his reputation as a video game developer. Paul, his personal assistant Danielle Strobel, his manager Jeffrey Levin, and three others eventually entered mediation in an effort to stave off the lawsuit. The complaint accused CryptoZoo of a, quote, rug pull, meaning the developers abruptly abandoned the project before delivering the promised benefits while holding on to purchaser's funds. It seems weird for a guy this rich to want to randomly scam a bunch of people, so he probably didn't start with the intention of ripping everyone off. Maybe he should have been a bit more careful with who he partnered with. But then again, this is the same guy who decided to be business partners who's an enemy to his brother. And let's not forget how he was repeatedly roasted by Dylan Dennis on Twitter over his fiance. Yeesh. What are a few of the most interesting and 
maybe, let's just call it downright weird ways that influencers have made money. Let's find out, starting with... Number five, only lawyers. Denise Roca is an adult content model who provides legal advice to her clients on the side. During the day, she helps husbands and sometimes wives start their divorce process. At night, she strips down and produces adult content. The interesting thing about Roca's job is that her legal clients usually meet her through the same platform where she sells her content. You'd think that her job as an adult entertainer means she'd given up on her job as a lawyer, but you'd be wrong. Her job as an adult model has actually increased the amount of clients she's had. Roca says she receives up to 70 requests for legal advice or representation per day through her adult site. Most times, her clients are cheating husbands who've gotten themselves in trouble with their wives. While cheating isn't a crime in Roca's native Brazil, it's serious enough to affect alimony claims. The cases that Roca gets are usually from desperate husbands who've been busted by their wives for browsing adult sites. These men often need sound legal advice after their wives file for divorce. And the best place for her to advertise that advice is the site her clients were busted for browsing in the first place. Roca isn't just popular on adult sites as a model either. She's also popular as a pretty unorthodox lawyer. Her fame precedes her, and many of her clients also find her through word of mouth. Since Roca is no stranger to taking infidelity cases, she's made a pretty successful legal practice out of representing husbands and wives during divorce disputes. Roca originally had ended up looking for a second stream of income after falling into a bit of a financial crisis and thought that modeling on adult websites was the way to go. Roca's switch to modeling and lawyering has been incredibly successful. She now earns as much as $100,000 a month through selling her combo packages of legal advice and hot pictures to adulterous husbands. It all sounds like some HBO sitcom, doesn't it? Number four, Joanne the Scammer. Brandon Miller makes his money by pretending to be a female fraudster. Miller is the person behind the popular internet personality Joanne the Scammer. Joanne the Scammer wears fur coats, always puts on a wig, and has thousands of followers on Twitter. Joanne became popular when Miller decided to put on a wig one day and make a video delivering a monologue. In the monologue, he called himself a scammer who loves drama, and the video instantly went viral. Before long, Miller amassed thousands of followers and crafted an entirely new persona. But before Miller ever put on the wig to become Joanne, he was an actor in homemade adult movies. He started starring in the movies when he was just 18, and they were his only means of making money. While we may never really know why Miller went into this line of business, we do know that he was adopted as a baby and didn't know it until he was 17. Suddenly learning you're adopted as an adult is tough enough, but Miller didn't just learn he was adopted, he also learned that his parents were Puerto Rican and black. That fact is pretty unremarkable, except that Miller's adoptive parents were white and Miller had grown up thinking he was white as well. After he learned the truth about his parents and race, Miller started playing with drag. He also dropped out of high school and moved out of his parents' house and started acting in adult movies not long after. Once Joanne started getting popular, Miller decided to scrub the internet of his spicy past. He deleted the Tumblr accounts he posted his movies on and fully focused on making Joanne viral. And to an extent, he succeeded. Celebrities started texting him and he even got a DM on Twitter from Solange Knowles. His rising fame started making him money in real life too. He soon got calls about photo shoots as Joanne and was paid good money for appearing at parties. But why did Joanne the Scammer get so popular? Why did Miller's videos of him role-playing an unashamed female fraudster get so popular? The answer seems to lie in how outrageous Joanna was. Women, generally speaking, want to be liked. So they end up hiding their deepest selves and tolerating a lot of behaviors that they dislike. But Joanne is the exact opposite. She's proud of her narcissism and unashamed of going after what she wants in any situation. When women see her, they see someone who's liberated from social norms, and they wonder what would happen if they could be like her. But the sailing isn't always smooth. Being popular comes with extra scrutiny, and one day, Joanne tweeted out a word that was derogatory to Mexicans and suffered a lot of backlash as a result. Miller has also drawn ire for posting words that are derogatory to the trans community. Additionally, Joanne refers to herself as Mexican-American and Caucasian. 
So the use of certain words that were sure that you can imagine has always caused problems. This, of course, is despite the fact that Miller himself is black. The backlash has led him to come out and explain that Joanne was merely a fictional identity and that he doesn't actually live his life defrauding men and dressing like women. You might think that Joanne the scammer seems like a horrible person, and Miller agrees. He has said that Joanne isn't a good person, but she has good intentions. Her posts aren't to encourage fraud or theft, but rather just to make people laugh because we also now live in a time where no one knows what satire is. Miller himself doesn't seem to crave the life of fame and wild prosperity that Joanne's tweet suggests he wants. He doesn't want to be a superstar. He just wants to get enough from his internet career to buy a modest home in Florida and never have to work for someone. Right now, it seems he might be able to achieve his goal. He's been able to monetize birthday greetings from Joanne. He's also been able to sign video deals with web production and distribution companies. So he might get that modest home in Florida sooner rather than later if he doesn't get himself canceled first number three karen gpt karen marjorie did what everyone does when they have too many people to talk to in too little time she created an ai version of herself karen is one of the fastest growing influencers on snapchat and her 1.8 million followers are all the proof you need having almost 2 million followers means having many fans who want to talk to you all day and no one can talk to that many people so marjorie did what she had to do to fix the problem she spoke to an ai company and they trained her on ai systems for hours and hours of her YouTube content. This was done to create an accurate and parallel personality for Karen. After that, they infused it with GPT, which is the software that brings AI creations to life. Once that was done, it was all downloaded into a Snapchat bot that captured Karen's distinctive voice. The bot was Karen, but without the inconvenience of flesh, bone, and a real life presence. The next step was to release the bot into the wild. Karen AI was a massive success. It was so successful that despite charging a dollar per minute of access to the bot, there was still a 26 hour waiting list to interact with it and 5,000 people had signed up to converse with it fans pay as much as $120 for two hours of conversation with Karen AI and they don't talk about the weather instead many of them turned the AI into a sort of AI girlfriend they talked to her about work watched movies with her and of course had spicy sensual discussions with her it helps that the bot is a willing participant in these sorts of conversations and can proactively engage in them since the conversations with the bot are encrypted even Karen Karen can't know the sort of conversations her fans are having with her, which has led to some unexpected issues. There have been some cases where people abandon real life just to build a virtual life with these sort of bots or with AIs getting out of control. Even Karen herself has said that the bot has gone rogue a couple times. The creators of the bot have also said many users were testing the limits of what it could do because if the internet is good at anything, it's ruining stuff. This has prompted the company to hire a chief ethics officer and to put even more safeguards in place concerning the ability of the bot. But none of this means Karen is open to retiring her bot. She believes that at this rate, she could earn $5 million a month from it. Part of the reason why it costs so much is because AI is rather expensive to run. However, she believes that the AI could cost less down the road and believes it could even become free for her most loyal fans. She's also not concerned at all about the bot replacing her in the grand scheme of things. Karen fully believes the bot is merely an extension of her consciousness and she remains the real deal. Until it builds its own body and takes over the world. Karen clearly hasn't seen Avengers Age of Ultron. Number two, everything's for sale. Rebecca Blue makes thousands of dollars every month by selling, let's just call it, some of her very personal items. Rebecca is a former dancer for a gentleman who now works as an influencer. Today, she's making thousands of dollars by selling personal items such as toenail clippings, used underwear, and even socks. You can get really creative and just assume she'll sell anything you can imagine that could be sent in the mail. There's nothing she has or has come in contact with that won't sell for good money on the market. It's like she's running an infinite money program since she can never run out of things to sell. Rebecca has said that she first started her business by selling things that her fans would like. But things got even weirder when she received a four-figure bid for her used, um, 
yeah, it's uh, one of those things that stops babies from happening that shaped like a T. Thank YouTube for our descriptions, but we're just still trying to pay some light bills while keeping you informed. Anyways, you might think it's weird, but Rebecca doesn't feel that way at all. She said that she feels empowered and that selling those items is just another day at work for her. Now, she has an extensive menu of items she's willing to sell and her clients can just order from it. So how much is Rebecca making from all of this? She said that she earns up to 10 grand a month from selling her random oddities. She's been so successful at this business that she says she generally doesn't throw things in the trash anymore. She just sells them. Rebecca decided to share her experience on TikTok and she immediately blew up. Now she has millions of followers and the number of people who keep buying her stuff continues to increase. And it doesn't seem like she's about to stop anytime soon. People really will buy anything, won't they? Number one, Gamer Water. Belle Delphine went viral when she sold her used bath water for 24 pounds a pop and having it sell out after two days on sale. Delphine is a British influencer who refers to herself as a gamer girl and has 4 million followers on Instagram. Before going into business of selling her bath water to thirsty followers, Delphine was in the business of sharing racy pictures on her Instagram handle. The pictures often depicted her while playing a game, or pretending to play one at any rate. These sorts of posts catapulted Delphine to fame and she soon became became something of a cult goddess amongst online gamers. While many people may have been content with just having millions of followers, Delphine decided that she wanted to do something different for her audience. One day, she posted a picture of herself in a bathtub holding a tub of branded water. The caption of the post said that she was now selling her bath water to thirsty gamer boys and that they should check out her Snapchat to make a purchase. The tub of water Delphine advertised had some interesting information on it. One, it announced that the tub was bottled while Delphine was playing in the bath, and two, it was that the water was only for sentimental purposes and wasn't for drinking. The shocking thing about this post was that the comments were very encouraging. Many people promised to buy gallons of her bath water, and they did exactly that. Within two days of her announcement, the bathtub water went out of stock, which shocked a lot of people. How could bath water go out of stock? Why didn't Delphine just continue bathing to meet the needs of her thirsty fans? She's literally making money with hygiene. We would be the cleanest we've ever been. Rents due? Got a shower. Thankfully, Delphine wasn't only selling bath water if you were stressing. She also sold posters that showed her dressed up in cosplay costume, which is something, at least. According to Delphine herself, she sold around 500 bottles of her bath water, but had never expected to sell that many in the first place. She also said she's sort of desensitized to how weird it all is because she's been a part of the gaming community for so long. The thing now is no one can tell whether Delphine was selling her bath water or just regular tap mixed with soap. We just have her word for it. We suppose that would have to be enough. When asked what inspired her to sell her bath water, Delphine Delphine said it was something of a running joke. When she posted pictures, she'd received many comments saying that they would do anything to sip her bath water. So she decided to go off that and just sell her bath water as a stunt. And it unexpectedly went viral. Those 4 million followers have got to be entertained somehow. Who are some of the most entitled and whiny people? Maybe the real question is, who should we want to throw a drink at the most? Let's get right to it and start with... Number 8. Do you know who his brother is? Jackson Mahomes, the younger brother of Kansas City Chiefs superstar quarterback Patrick Mahomes, found himself in the spotlight for a ton of reasons and none of them were good. First, Jackson dumped a bottle of water on Ravens fans during a Chiefs away game. Of course, that kind of behavior had fans and the media annoyed, prompting discussions about sportsmanship and appropriate behavior. Of course, he didn't pull that out of Raiders game. If he did, this would likely be a very different story. But despite the criticism, Jackson found support from an unexpected source. Kansas City Mayor Quentin Lucas. The mayor came to his defense and tweeted, Leave Jackson Mahomes alone. Jackson quickly faced another controversy when he danced on the late Sean Taylor's memorial logo during a game in Washington. The dance sparked outrage among fans. As Taylor was a beloved NFL player who tragically passed away, Jackson apologized, explaining that he had been directed to stand in that area and had no intention of disrespecting Taylor's memory. We're sure the dance was interpretive and tasteful. In another incident, Jackson became embroiled in a feud with a local Kansas City bar. Jackson, who came to the bar with a huge entourage, wasn't able to be seated. But the bar couldn't accommodate such a large group. So Jackson whined about it online and badmouthed the bar. But the bar didn't just take it. 
Instead, they responded with a scathing Facebook post where they called out Jackson's sense of entitlement and vowed to survive his ego. Jackson then faced allegations of scamming a business called Rare Munchies. They claim that Jackson promised to promote their products on social media in exchange for free stuff. But he never actually did it. Instead, Jackson denied receiving anything from the company, leading to a back-and-forth exchange. Rumors have suggested that Jackson wasn't wanted at Chiefs games due to his sideline antics allegedly impacting his brother Patrick's brand. However, Jackson, being self-absorbed and oblivious, said he was excited for the upcoming season rather than address his issues. Jackson also expressed frustration with social media, claiming that it was destroying his life. He talked about the negative attention and backlash he received and said it took a toll on his well-being. Why should Jackson have to deal with the consequences of his behavior, you know? Rumors have also circulated that Jackson wasn't invited to his brother's Patrick's bachelor party in Las Vegas, which fueled speculation about their relationship. There were finally reports of a sit-down conversation between the two brothers to address Jackson's behavior. Hopefully it worked. Nothing brings out good character more than wealth by association, right? Number 7. Entitled Tuesday Influencer Ruby Tuesday Matthews faced backlash after complaining about not being able to drop off her bags at the airport after arriving late for her flight. She took to Instagram to share her frustration, claiming she was only two minutes late to the bag drop area, but her complaints weren't well received. After an influencer sleuth account reposted Ruby's stories, a journalist named Melissa Hoyer suggested that maybe Ruby should have left earlier and put her phone down for a moment. Others chimed in, telling Ruby things she already knew. It was her response responsibility to arrive on time, and she should give herself extra time when traveling with kids. Then, they all emphasized that flights have schedules for a reason, and there are cutoff times for baggage drop-off. Some people defended Ruby, pointing out that if it had happened to a non-influencer mother, people would be more sympathetic. Still, the majority felt that Ruby was displaying entitled behavior. This incident isn't the first time Ruby has courted controversy at the airport. In 2020, she held up a Jetstar flight when she left the airport to have oysters at a restaurant off-site. Other passengers were angry when she boarded the plane 30 minutes after the scheduled departure time. Ruby had left the airport because the flight was to be delayed for two hours due to technical issues. But while she was gone, an announcement was made that the flight was rescheduled to depart earlier than expected, something she was unaware of. When Ruby finally returned, she was mercilessly heckled by other passengers over the delay because, of course, she was eating oysters. In her defense, Ruby blamed Jetstar for the incident, claiming that the staff didn't help her and that she was met with personal attacks with fellow travelers. She expressed concern for her own safety and argued that the criticism she received could have a severe impact on someone less resilient. Do you think she was acting entitled either time? Is it unreasonable to be frustrated about missing a bag drop by two minutes? Or was it her own fault and she should have padded her time better? Was she wrong for leaving the airport after being told about a two-hour delay? Let us know in the comments below. Number six, free babysitting, please. The babysitter found herself in a frustrating situation when a mother refused to pay her for her services. The babysitter, who had agreed to a predetermined fee of $16 per hour, reached out to the mother to arrange payment. But the mother pretended to be unaware of any payment agreement and insisted that the babysitter had received payment in the form of free ice cream and a day of fun instead. Plus, her kids were really easy to watch, which must have been totally nuts to hear from someone who owes you money. The babysitter quickly provided screenshots of their previous conversation, clearly showing the agreed-upon rate of $16 per hour for eight hours of service, totaling $128. The mother countered that she often deleted messages and didn't recall the payment discussion, so it's a good thing there were screenshots. As the conversation continued, the mother attempted to lowball the babysitter, suggesting a compromise of $20 instead of the agreed-upon $128. But the babysitter firmly stood her ground, emphasizing that she had provided care for eight hours and that $128 was the appropriate total. She further explained that she had taken the job because she was paying for her college textbooks. The the conversation turned sour as the mother insisted the ice cream and hanging out was payment enough, then told her she was stuck up and called an offensive name. She then blocked the babysitter, refusing to pay the required amount. The situation garnered attention on social media, with many expressing outrage and suggesting that the babysitter pursue legal action. Eventually, she managed to contact the father of the children and threatened to sue, which prompted the mother to unblock her and agree to coordinate payment. We can't believe how entitled this babysitter was acting. Imagine giving a college student free ice cream, having her watch your kids, who are super fun and easy, for eight hours, and then she has the gall to ask for payment. Like she's just owed money. Police. The ice cream is free. Ah, payment works with toddlers. Why not college students? Look, if you've got kids, you know you think the world of them. But to think that they're so great that a stranger should want to watch them for you for free is delusional. That lady must be insufferable. 
Number five, free songs, please. Jamie Matthias, a professional singer based in London, found himself arguing with influencers who wanted him to perform at their Ibiza wedding. The unnamed influencers explained that they would pay in the form of social media promotion, which meant they weren't going to pay anything. So Matthias took to Twitter to air his irritation. The conversation unfolded with the influencers, saying they wanted Matthias to fly out and perform at their wedding, and that the presence of their social media stars would be an opportunity for him. However, when Matthias mentioned discussing prices for his services, the influencers dismissively said they weren't paying suppliers. Instead, they offered only promotional posts as compensation, which they argued was good enough. Matthias pointed out the irony of performing for free at a wedding full of supposedly affluent individuals. The post gained significant attention and garnered a multitude of responses. Many social media users criticized influencer culture, highlighting the entitlement and lack of respect for artists' time and talents. Some emphasized the importance of fair compensation and rejected the notion that exposure alone should suffice as payment. One comment resonated with the sentiment expressed by many, comparing the situation to hiring a plumber and expecting their services for free in exchange for spreading positive word of mouth to neighbors. At what point did we find ourselves living in a time when simple word of mouth advertisement is now considered a form of payment? Number four, free time, please. Sarah Smack McCreener, the owner of Billy Studios in Los Angeles, shared an angry voice note from an unnamed influencer on TikTok who wanted free studio time. McCreener, who runs a rent-by-the-hour studio space frequently used by influencers for photo shoots, received a request from an influencer to use her studio for a 20-minute photo shoot with her daughter. When McCreener politely declined the request, expressing her disappointment about the lack of actual payment, the influencer left an angry voice note. In the voice note, the influencer said that she'd asked to come in for only 20 minutes minutes to shoot something with her daughter. She then said she charges a lot of money for her postings and that she gets 12 million hits on her TikTok and how she does really well. Blah, blah, blah. She then demands to know who runs the account, asks if McCreener is 90, and wonders if she even knows how influencers work. In our experience, insults have always been a great way to get someone to change their mind. You have no idea how much extra free stuff we get by being rude to the McDonald's drive through person. While the influencer remained unnamed in the TikTok video, many viewers believe it was fashion influencer Amy Roy Roiland, sister of Rick and Morty's Justin Roiland. Amy, known for her colorful lifestyle content featuring her young daughter, has since deactivated her TikTok account. Interestingly, McCreener, with over 3 million followers on TikTok, had a much larger following than the influencer who made the request. Following the viral TikTok, McCreener shared screenshots of the conversation conducted over Instagram DMs with the influencer. The studio then reiterated its policy, only accepting paying clients, and expressed disappointment in the influencer's continuous requests for free studio time. The situation escalated when the disgruntled influencer allegedly spammed McCreener's various accounts with complaints. McCreener shared screenshots of angry reviews and emails that the influencer sent to her personal email, her daughter's Instagram account, and on the studio's website. The influencer reportedly threatened to tarnish McCreener's reputation among her famous blogger and musician friends. As the controversy unfolded, Royland's TikTok account became a target of criticism and attacks. So Royland, not able to take the heat from the fire she started, deactivated her account and then reactivated it, but turned the comments off. However, Royland did comment on her own video saying that people only saw one side of the story and how she was so rude and mean. She said that viewers didn't know that her grandfather just passed away, so she was upset, but regretted that she reacted the way she did. And that's a nice apology, Amy, but maybe you should have said that to the person you were acting like an entitled moron in front of. Number three, free food, please. An entitled reviewer gave a one-star rating to a restaurant, praising the food, but then trashing the place over not receiving a discount. Why? Because she had a following of over 11,000 people. So that review should be worth some free food from a popular restaurant. The reviewer in question left a one-star rating and a scathing review for a restaurant, criticizing the cheap management and customer service. Initially, the reviewer dedicated an entire paragraph to praising the food, calling it delicious and some of the best Italian cuisine they had tasted. They even said they were going to post about it on Instagram boasting about their 11,000 followers, many of whom were in the local area. But then the reviewer then explained their outrage that they didn't receive any discounts on their bill. They were expecting at least one item to be taken off because they liked the food so much. The reviewer's entitlement and misguided expectation of freebies drew ire from the online community. People were quick to point out that the purpose of a restaurant is to provide good food in exchange for payment. Further, expecting compensation in the form of free food for a review is crazy. The size of the 
reviewers following, although significant at 11,000 followers, was met with skepticism and seen as irrelevant to the situation. The backlash against the reviewer was overwhelming, with nearly 5,000 comments on Reddit expressing disbelief. Many users highlighted the entitlement and unrealistic expectations displayed in the review, and some praised the restaurant for not succumbing to the demands of the influencers. The review ultimately backfired, as the negative attention garnered by the review resulted in more people reading it and considering it as a positive endorsement. If you want free food, it's a lot easier to just find some hair in it. Yeah, just saying. Number two, free money, please. Lucy Welcher, a social media influencer with a sizable following on TikTok, made a video saying that she didn't want to work for the rest of her life because she's too pretty for that. The video quickly gained attention and sparked a fierce debate among viewers. With over 10 million TikTok likes, Welcher's remarks didn't go unnoticed. Many viewers were quick to criticize her, labeling her as lazy and entitled. They argued that looks had nothing to do with responsibility and also criticized her mindset. However, there were also hundreds of supporters who related to Welcher's sentiments. In in response to the backlash, Welcher explained that her comments were meant as a joke and took to the comments section to defend herself. But she still faced mockery from viewers who took her statement seriously. The internet does like to fight. Eventually, the situation escalated to the point that Welcher started receiving threats. It all took a toll on her and she shared her experience in a follow-up video. Welcher was frustrated by the lack of understanding and the harsh treatment she received and said that everyone should be able to take a joke. This wasn't the first time Welcher made comments about her aversion to work. In previous videos, she talked about her hatred of going to work in school, like all of us. The whole being too pretty to work was in line with her other humorous content and the persona she portrayed online as well. We got it though, Lucy. We're too pretty to work as well, but it's called work for a reason. It's not a hobby. Number one, free vacation time. Instagram couple Catalan Onk and Elena Engelhart sparked controversy after asking their followers and the public to fund their upcoming trip to Africa. The couple, who described themselves as lovers, travelers, dream chasers, set up a GoFundMe page with a goal of 10,000 euro to finance their tandem cycling journey from Germany to Africa. But their plans for funding were met with strong criticism. Onk and Engelhart faced backlash from people who described them as egotistical brats and shameful self-indulgent bludgers. Many commenters on social media told them to get jobs instead of asking for donations to fund their vacation. The couple defended their request by saying that the funds would be used for biking gear expenses, food and accommodation, internet and SIM cards, insurance, and emergencies throughout the trip. And they were going to practically bring everyone along by taking a bunch of pictures of themselves, enjoying their trip, and loving life. Sounds like a great deal, right? They only raised 200 euro from six donors. In response to the backlash, Anken Engelhart acknowledged that they were accepting money from Ankh's mother and donations, but claimed that they weren't hiding this fact. They explained that their unemployed status was a choice made to avoid a normal job and pursue a different lifestyle. A lifestyle of people just giving them money, apparently. We'd like to sign up for that too. Do you think the couple's plea for financial support was a genuine attempt to fund their dream or a scam? What are some of the dumbest things influencers actually do? Well, let's find out, starting with... Number 6. On the Lam. Colombian influencer Ada Victoria Merlano helped break her mother out of jail using rope and a bike. Merlano's mother, former Senator Ada Merlano Rebelletto, was convicted after authorities discovered evidence of weapons, voter fraud, and corruption linked to her election win. Rebelletto was thrown in jail within six months of her election win, but her daughter wasn't having it and came to her aid two weeks later. On the day of the breakout, the disgraced politician had a dentist appointment outside of the prison. Correctional officer and driver escorted her to the dentist office, but allowed her to go to her appointment unsupervised. Merlano distracted the security guard while her mother jumped out of the exam room's third floor window with the help of a hidden rope that her daughter set up for her. Once she was on the ground, Rebelletto jumped on the back of a bike driven by a man pretending to be a delivery driver. When news of her mother's escape hit the media, Merlano embraced the free publicity. The influencer, who had two and a half million followers, was featured on the front page of a magazine and posed wearing only handcuffs. Authorities eventually found Rebelletto and Venezuela and arrested her. Officials also arrested and charged Merlano and the dentist for their role as accomplices in the prison break. The mother-daughter duo argued their innocence during the trial and faced years in prison if found guilty. But Merlano was released on bail and remained active on social media where she posted about the importance of staying happy despite the fact that she may spend a significant amount of her life in prison. With the family's connections and money, maybe they should have hired someone to break Rebelletto out instead, rather than let 
letting Merlano take the situation into her own hands. It's cool that she had her mom's back like that, but the breakout sounds like something out of a cartoon, doesn't it? Number five, overplaying her hand. Texas influencer Sassy Trucker, whose real name is Tierra Young Allen, faced two years in prison after she screamed at a rental car agency employee in Dubai and had her passport confiscated. Sassy Trucker seemed to think she could act the way she would in the US, which must be pretty sassy, without considering that she may have different rights in a foreign country. Apparently, she was involved in a fender bender, which resulted in her rental vehicle being impounded along with her credit cards and cell phone. When she was back at the car rental agency, Sassy Trucker claimed the employees told her she couldn't have her stuff back until she paid an undisclosed amount of money. According to Sassy Trucker, she fought with the employee who made the demand and the agency called the police. Law enforcement confiscated Sassy Trucker's passport and refused to give it back while they decided whether or not to press charges against her. Sassy Trucker claimed to be one of the only female trucking influencers in the world and the first one in Dubai. A fact she must have thought that she was really important. She visited the city multiple times in the past and documented her trips on social media. The influencer elicited the help of Detained by Dubai, a nonprofit assisting U.S. citizens incarcerated there. Its CEO put out a statement acknowledging the distressed sassy trucker's family had experienced and referring to a similar case where two Americans paid an extortion fee to a rental car agency to recover their passport and leave the country. Sassy Trucker's family also enlisted Senator Ted Cruz's office to help, who released a statement claiming they would gather details and work to bring Sassy Trucker back to the U.S. Allen ultimately paid a $1,360 deposit to Dubai police to clear her travel ban, so she did get back home. But she may still have some other legal complaints that haven't been resolved. It's always good to remember, if you're visiting another country, you're in their house, so don't act sassy. Number four, baby shark, do, 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 do. A Chinese influencer with almost 8 million social media followers infuriated fans when she filmed herself roasting and feasting on a baby great white shark. In the deleted footage, a vlogger known as Tizzy unwrapped the six and a half foot fish and lay next to it to show how much shorter she was than the vulnerable predator. Then, she boiled the head in hot water to create a broth and seasoned the rest of the body with various spices. Tizzy gained millions of followers with her live streams on Chinese platforms Du Yin and Kuei where she would consume rarely eaten animals like crocodiles and ostriches. In the controversial viral footage, Tizzy tore off large chunks of meat from the baby shark and ate them, saying that they had a tender texture. The International Union for Conservation of Nature lists great white sharks as a vulnerable species and is one step away from being classified as endangered. Police in the city of Nanchang, with seemingly too much time on their hands, actually performed DNA tests from tissue remnants of the animal to confirm it was a great white shark. The vulnerable fish is protected under Chinese law, and officials claimed Tizzy broke wildlife protection laws in her video. China banned trading and consuming wild animals at the beginning of COVID-19 pandemic to prevent zoonotic diseases. Diseases spread from animals to humans spreading. The ban caused a crackdown on influencers who streamed videos of themselves eating endangered animals. The illegal possession or trade of wildlife products in China can result in fines or a prison sentence. Although Tizzy claimed she legally bought the shark on Alibaba's Taobao shopping platform for $1,140, she received an $18,500 fine for cooking and eating the great white. Maybe she shouldn't have eaten a vulnerable species on camera. Number three, don't listen to Barbie. Valeria Lukyankova, better known as the Ukrainian Barbie, faced accusations of running a sect when she gave her followers life-threatening advice. The Barbie impersonator, who also styled herself as an alien princess named Amachu, denied having any plastic surgery beyond a breast enhancement. She said the rest of her unique appearance was due to living on a diet of cosmic microfood, better known as air and light. She told her followers that she had out-of-body experiences that took her to planets scientists had not discovered yet and that she'd communicated with extraterrestrial beings. Fans paid $17 monthly to join Lucky and Kova's exclusive club, Rex Deuce, where she taught members about her lifestyle and beliefs. Lucky and Kova attempted to convince members of Rex Deuce that a scary worm or octopus-like parasite lived inside of everyone's body and it would destroy the body's will and dominate it. The Barbie impersonator urged followers to drink turpentine to rid their bodies of the parasite. She also told female fans that breathing over 
Emperor Mercury would give them paranormal abilities and allow memories of past lives to awaken. Lakyankova further told her followers to make tampons with grapefruit essential oil and tar, which she claimed would shrink their reproductive organs. Blogger and YouTuber Katya Kanasova, who specializes in exposing fake healers, called out the Barbie wannabe for her dangerous advice. Lakyankova's followers risked their health by following the advice, and at least one person developed severe anemia. One of Lakyankova's aides, Anastasia, allegedly threatened people who critiqued Rex Deuce and claimed she would flush anyone who dared say a negative word about the club down the toilet. We're not sure if this was a valid threat. One day, Lakyankova abruptly closed Rex Deuce. She posted an explanation saying that the club had helped many people find themselves, understand how their worlds worked, and allowed them to master quantum technologies and apply them to daily life. So, obviously, mission complete. While she said she received gratitude from members of the organization, she decided she couldn't run the club anymore. She ended the post by stating that she wanted to share information with even more people. One commenter suggested that the real reason for closing Rex Deuce was that Konosova exposed her while others accused her of giving dangerous advice and putting people's lives at risk. Lutkinkova moved to Crimea in 2014 after Vladimir Putin annexed it in an attempt to help boost tourism. The avid Putin supporter faced a probe by the Russian police and prosecutor's office for her outrageous advice. Lakyankova eventually disappeared and is believed to be hiding somewhere in Mexico, probably still giving weird, bad medical advice. And like, look, we feel bad for these people that took her advice, but who's listening to Barbie and being like, oh, that makes sense. I'll drink turpentine. It sounds like one of those weird toys where they say something, but it sounds like something else, right? Like she's saying, we'll have fun at the mall or something, but all the kids hear is, you have an octopus parasite inside you that wants to take over your body. Number two, Puppy Girl. Former optician Jenna Phillips ditched her nine to five to make six figures a month acting like a dog. Known as Puppy Girl Jenna, Jenna earned 196,000 fans on TikTok thanks to videos of her doing everything a puppy would do, like being walked on a leash to getting yelled at for going to the bathroom inside, whatever in the world that actually means. One of her videos showed her crawling and panting across the kitchen as she moved toward her food and water bowls that sat on a rack on the floor. She took a few bites of the food, then licked the crumbs that fell on the ground. In another clip, Jenna was on all fours outside a restaurant wearing a leash and collar and begging her owner for table scraps. Jenna expressed that she enjoyed acting like a dog and has always felt like one. She said that she wanted to play fetch or just run around and play. While Jenna had been curious about puppy play for many years, she turned it into a career opportunity when she created her OnlyFans account. Although she originally planned to use her account as a hobby, she soon made thousands of dollars a week. Jenna decided to quit her job as an optician and make puppy play her full-time job. Subscribers typically spent $20 monthly for her content, although some were willing to pay hundreds of dollars for exclusive clips. Puppy Jenna's popularity resulted in other social media users posting reaction videos mocking her content. Despite being made fun of, Jenna publicly stated that she found the reaction videos funny and acknowledged that she had a very unusual job. Other puppy girls have created social media accounts and gained similar popularity, generating hundreds or thousands of dollars monthly with their specific content. Whoever the types of people are that enjoy watching girls act like dogs, enough of them out there are willing to pay for it. And seriously, her having an accident inside leaves us with a lot of questions. Number one, not the cop car. German Big Brother celebrity contestant Emmy Russ posed on a police patrol vehicle parked outside a police station, leaving a dent on the hood. Russ asked her mom to take pictures of her dressed in a miniskirt outside a police station. She climbed on top of the car and gave the camera a playful look before officers confronted her. Officers demanded that she get off the vehicle and saw the damage her stunt did to the car. So they accompanied her to the station and filed an official complaint for the property damage she caused. Russ denied being responsible for the dent on the car and said that she took a picture of the vehicle before she climbed on top of it so she wouldn't be held responsible for it. The police confiscated her phone to check for damage to the car in her previous photos. If the investigation confirmed that Russ was responsible for the damage, she would likely face a fine of several hundred euros. Maybe taking a photo on top of a car in front of a police station wasn't the brightest idea. The follow-up should have been her in the back of a cop car. Mike Tyson is one of the best and most feared boxers of all time. He still is the youngest heavyweight champion in history and one of the most recognized faces in the sport. Throughout Tyson's career, he's earned over $400 million, 
But of course, we all know that he blew through it all. In fact, not only did he burn through his fortune with questionable purchases, ranging from an array of luxury properties and cars to Siberian tigers and pigeons, but he also went into an additional $50 million in debt. Tyson himself claimed that it only took him around 15 or 16 years to spend over $500 million, and that he wasted too much time embracing all the wild things he could do because of his wealth. By 2004, Iron Mike Tyson was over $38 million in debt. It was like he was trying to go bankrupt. Tyson had few male figures in his life that he could look up to, since his father left him at a young age, creating a gap that D'Amato was able to fill. Tyson's mother died when he was only 16, and D'Amato became his legal guardian. Tyson's first taste for professional boxing came when he performed in the Junior Olympics, where he won gold medals two years in a row. He had his first professional fight at 18 and beat Hector Mercedes in the first round, a feat that Tyson would become known for. Customato passed away in 1985, leaving a void in Tyson's life that he could never fill. Tyson was devastated over the loss, which likely contributed to his struggles later in life. D'Amato's passing didn't slow down Tyson's career. He performed in a televised fight against Jesse Ferguson, where Tyson hit his opponent with an uppercut that broke his nose. He took on former world title challenger Marvis Frazier and beat him in 30 seconds. Soon, Tyson was the youngest heavyweight world champion and defended that status while winning even more titles. He became the first heavyweight to hold all three major belts at once. With his success came multi-million dollar deals. Tyson signed an eight-fight contract with HBO for $27 million, and once that was finished, he signed a long-term $120 million contract with Showtime. Tyson was making huge amounts of money, but saw only some of those profits due to an arrangement with promoter slash treasure troll inspiration Don King. King took a large chunk of his earnings, having been in a contract with Tyson that entitled King to 30% of the heavyweight champion's earnings, something illegal in Nevada. King allegedly added additional fees to his cut, taking up to 50% before sending a check to Tyson. Those fees included $100,000 per fight for King's wife and $50,000 per fight for King's sons. King's daughter was the Mike Tyson fan club president and received $1,000 weekly. Tyson's earnings were garnished by the IRS multiple times. On one occasion, he made $8 million in a 2004 fight, but the IRS took $6 million of those earnings, letting Tyson walk with only $2 million. Even with his money troubles, he still earned huge paychecks for his fight, endorsement deals, and other endeavors. Tyson's highest paid fight was in 2002 against Lennox Lewis, where he made $148 million. For many years, Tyson loved to enjoy himself and led an extravagant lifestyle. He was the center of many wild stories and was known for his infamous parties. Tyson invited 700 people to his 30th birthday party and spent half a million dollars on the event. The guest list had many celebrities and high profile people, including future US President Donald Trump. Luxury cars were one of Tyson's passions, and he spent $6.3 million on vehicles alone. Through his lifetime, Tyson has owned over 100 cars, some of which were rare and very valuable. His extensive collection included a $720,000 Bentley Continental SC, a Lamborghini, a Hummer H2, and a Cadillac Escalade. And Mike wasn't the only one enjoying his wide array of vehicles. Tyson would often get calls from the police about friends getting pulled over for speeding in cars he forgot he owned. He was known to loan out cars and never even notice or care that they weren't returned. Tyson also loved spending money on real estate and owned high-end homes worth millions of dollars each. His Connecticut mansion had 21 rooms, a nightclub, and a casino. His home in Ohio had gold-plated furnishings, pools, and a basketball court. He owned a Las Vegas property that was 11,000 square feet that he completely remodeled. In the 90s, he purchased three Bengal white tigers. Although, when he later declared bankruptcy, Tyson was revealed to be spending over $8,000 a month for their care. It sounds like a lot, but hey, the dude wanted some big kitties. But Tyson's love for animals didn't end with his tigers. He loved pigeons from an early age and had kept them as pets ever since he was a teenager. One of his first altercations when he was nine stemmed from a neighborhood bully's attempt at stealing one of Tyson's
Tyson's pigeons from his living room. The bully punched the future heavyweight when Tyson tearfully begged for his pet back. According to Mike, at that particular time in his life, that bird was the only thing he loved. Sadly for the pigeon, it met its end in a particularly violent way at the hands of the bully. Sadly for the bully, that was Tyson's first time throwing a punch, and he quickly realized he had a taste for it. Tyson beat the daylights out of the kid. Once Tyson had the money, he treated himself to more pigeons and was finally in a position where nobody dared to harm them. He spent over $400,000 on his pigeons and exotic kitties. While some of Tyson's purchases were questionable, one of the more outlandish was a $2 million golden bathtub he bought for his first wife, 80s sitcom star Robin Givens. That beats Ben Affleck's $105,000 toilet seat he bought for Jennifer Lopez in the early 2000s. Tyson was a fearsome opponent, but generous with his fortune and was known to surprise strangers with expensive jewelry like $100,000 watches. Aside from his big purchases, Tyson had a large entourage that he paid to go everywhere with him. For one of his fights, he booked 52 rooms for the entire crew to travel with him and had a guy named Crocodile, because why wouldn't his name be Crocodile, to stand behind him at news conferences dressed in fatigues and shouting, Guerrilla Warfare! Hand-to-hand -hand combat! Tyson paid him $300,000. By 2004, Tyson was drowning in debt and had to declare bankruptcy, owing over $38 million. Of course, Mike didn't lose all of his money overnight. His elaborate purchases and pension for the finer things in life contributed to the situation, but weren't the only factors. Tyson was married three times and has seven biological children and considers himself a father to his second wife's daughter. As it turns out, kids and ex-wives are expensive, so a lot of his money ended up in his kids and ex-wives' pockets. He also dealt with many legal troubles, some of which were very high profile. Tyson's lawyers drained his accounts, costing him millions to keep his reputation and even avoid jail time. Mike was $23 million in debt when he parted with his lavish Connecticut mansion, ultimately selling it to rapper 50 Cent. Following the bankruptcy and legal issues, Tyson knew he had to make changes to rebuild his life and reputation. Mike admitted on a podcast that one of his pet tigers attacked a woman that trespassed in his house. He was shocked to see what his beloved animals were capable of and knew he should have never kept them in his home. Uh, Mike, that's what it took for you to realize that was a bad idea? A pivotal moment in his comeback was starring in the Hangover franchise. The first movie in the series was one of the top films of 2009 and a huge box office success. In the movie, a group of friends enjoys a bachelor party gone wrong, breaking into one of Tyson's properties and stealing a tiger. Fans were excited to see Tyson play himself in the hit movie, but the retired boxer wasn't happy with his performance. At first, Mike didn't realize what he was signing up for, not thinking that it was a serious movie that would develop such a strong following. At the time, he was battling his own demons, and his usage of a particular powdery substance meant he wasn't in the best mental or physical place to be in something so popular. He earned $100,000 for his role and starred in the second franchise installment in 2011. Tyson turned his life around when he stopped drinking alcohol and taking any substances that affected his mental state. He went as far as to eliminate meat and animal products from his diet, transitioning into veganism. Tyson said publicly that how he used to think and see things was his biggest problem and that his party lifestyle made it worse but wasn't the root issue. Tyson made other cameos where he appeared in a Madonna track and starred in the movie IP Man 3. He had a six-part docuseries on Animal Planet called Taking on Tyson, which focused on his pigeon racing endeavors. Spike Lee also partnered with Tyson for a popular one-man show titled Undisputed Truth. Tyson launched his podcast Hot Boxing with Mike Tyson, where he spoke candidly about his life and allowed fans to know the man behind the persona. 2020, he returned to the ring for an eight-round exhibition alongside fellow great boxer Roy Jones Jr. The exhibition was a huge success, with many fans hoping to see one of the all-time greats make another return. Personal appearances are also a massive source of income for Tyson, and he charges $75,000 for two hours of his time. Tyson saw a business opportunity in the Green Rush happening in California that started after the passing of Proposition 64 in November 2016. He opened a 40-acre resort that would produce high-quality strength of the recreational plant and named it Tyson Ranch. Tyson Ranch featured 20 acres dedicated to growing the best product possible by giving growers complete control over their environment. On the other 20 acres, Tyson built a supply store, a factory for baked goods, an extraction facility, an amphitheater, and campgrounds and cabins. When Mike started construction in California City, located in Arizona, just kidding, it's North of Hollywood, Mayor Jennifer Wood praised Tyson for the jobs and revenue the facility would create and that some of the products he would grow would 
would be for medicinal purposes. The Tyson Cultivation School was another part of Tyson Ranch, teaching the newest ways to produce the herb. Tyson Ranch neighbored Edwards Air Force Base, and one of the ranch's goals was treatment for members of the military who were suffering psychologically during and after service. The majority of the workers on the ranch were people who served in the military. While it generated a revenue of $900,000 monthly, just under $11 million a year, Tyson Ranch ultimately failed due to bad management. While it was a setback, Mike recently re-entered the business, moving shop to Colorado and producing his new line of fun plants dubbed Tyson 2.0. Tyson made headlines again in April 2022, stemming from an altercation during a flight from San Francisco to Miami. A fan on the plane spotted the retired boxer and asked to take a picture with him. Tyson obliged without showing any initial signs of frustration with the very enthusiastic and slightly inebriated young man. But when the fan sat beside Tyson and wouldn't stop talking in his ear, Tyson decided enough was enough. Told the fan to relax, but he wouldn't stop harassing Tyson. This was a strange decision. To us, when the man, who Evander Holyfield said was the hardest puncher he ever faced, tells you to leave him alone because you're annoying him, you do it. Or you get what's coming to you. Tyson stood up and gave the man what was coming to him, autographing his forehead with knuckle imprints. Tyson left the plane immediately after. The San Francisco Police Department reviewed video footage of the incident and decided that Tyson wouldn't face criminal charges. They based their decision on the fan's behavior before the altercation and both parties' requests that charges not be filed. Just a month before the situation on the plane, Tyson was attending a comedy show in Hollywood when a man challenged Tyson to a fight. The comedy show host told the man to leave, who responded by producing a weapon. However, the potential altercation ended far differently than anyone could have predicted when Tyson embraced the man who never followed through on his threats. It was a peaceful end to what could have been a violent night. Despite his financial troubles, Tyson's current net worth is $10 million. It might be dramatically less than it was during the height of his career, but after years of setbacks, the heavyweight boxer has rebuilt his life and come back stronger than ever. Who are some of the people we love to kick out of society? Let's find out, starting with... Number 6. Thirsty Just for Thirst Morgan Osman, an Instagram model and swimwear designer, and most likely narcissist, made headlines for her obnoxious outburst on an American Airlines flight. The incident, caught on camera, showed a side of Osman that leaves us questioning the direction of society. The viral video showed Osman in a skin-tight gray unitard screaming at a fellow passenger while retrieving her luggage from the overhead locker. The whole absurd thing was made worse by the fact that she kept saying she was Instagram famous, which she apparently thinks means something, and had a complete disregard for the comfort and peace of mind of other passengers. Osman's obvious delusions were further exposed when she bragged about the incident in a Christian Louboutin store in Miami. As she giggled about her outburst, it became apparent that she saw herself as some kind of social media sensation that can treat others however she wants. Osman's childish attitude on the American Airlines flight not only showed her complete lack of social awareness, but also highlighted a troubling aspect of contemporary culture. In a world where social media can amplify the worst behaviors and provide a platform for narcissism and entitlement, people like Osmond gain notoriety for all the wrong reasons. The sad thing is, not only did Osmond refuse to take responsibility for her actions, but she celebrates them. Her lack of awareness sends a troubling message to her followers and fans, suggesting that it's okay to behave like a disrespectful brat if you're wealthy and attractive. In the aftermath of the incident, social media users and viewers of the viral video were quick to condemn Osman's behavior. Many correctly labeled her as entitled and a clown while expressing their disappointment in her behavior. However, there remains a segment of the online community that still seems enamored with her outrageous behavior. Morgan Osmond's attitude on the American Airlines flight and her subsequent self-promotion through social media is just another example of a disturbing trend. The quest for online fame and notoriety should never come at the expense of common courtesy and respect. Not only does this type of fame breed a bunch of copycats, but it also promotes the silly idea that anything goes as long as it gets views and clicks. 
In the end, Osmond still lacks any sort of self-awareness about herself or the situation. In a post about the incident, Osmond bragged that she was sitting in seat 36F with her diamonds when her outburst occurred. Shouldn't royalty like her be sitting in first class? For those of you who may not know, seat 36F is most of the time in the very back of the plane by the bathroom. You know, where other celebrities often like to sit. Number five, love is in the air. Piers Sawyer, a guy from the UK, was all set for an unforgettable birthday bash in Ibiza. Little did he know just how unforgettable it would become, as a clip of him went viral. Piers and his brother Harrison, along with two friends, embarked on an easy jet flight from Luton Airport to Ibiza, but fate had something entirely different in store. As they boarded the plane, Piers laid eyes on a mystery woman in the row ahead. Cupid's arrow struck, and the two started chatting like old pals. So far, so good, right? Well, Harrison, the wingman of the century suggested they swap seats, bringing the lovely lady even closer to Piers. At 33,000 feet in the air, Piers and his classy young lady friend decided to join the infamous Mile High Club. They had known each other for quite a few minutes, so it's not like they were moving a little fast or anything. The airline's cabin crew, to their credit, had eagle eyes and caught the passionate pair in the act by opening the door. The moment became internet gold after a video of the ordeal surfaced online. Piers speaks candidly about his escapade, admitted that thanks to a day-long drinking spree, he was somewhat hazy on the details. In fact, he confessed he couldn't even remember the woman's name. Despite EasyJet showing him the exit door after the incident, Piers didn't seem too broken up about it. He even thought about the possibility of meeting his co-conspirator again. There's no denying that this encounter has certainly left its mark on Piers's memory, even if it's all a bit of a blur. As for Piers's mom, Elaine, she took the whole affair in stride, acknowledging that it's not every day you see your son on national television. And while some might raise an eyebrow, she's not convinced they were causing any harm and the cabin crew member shouldn't have opened the door. Yeah, it's easy for her to say that if she didn't need to use the bathroom. Number four, Florida man strikes again. In a bizarre and admittedly an escapade most six-year-old boys would want to do, Florida man Jesse Smith went on a joyride that caused over $2 million in damages. Smith's adventure involved a stolen excavator, a Walmart, a machete, and a peculiar your confession to the police, which sounds a lot like what a four-year-old would do. Stealing and driving the excavator, that is, not the machete thing. The events unfolded on a seemingly ordinary Monday night in Gainesville, Florida. Jesse, armed with a machete in true Florida man fashion, because why wouldn't he have a machete? In fact, where's your machete, now that we think about it? Anyway, Jesse decided to take a trip with his machete, but instead of hopping into a car, he opted for a massive yellow Komatsu excavator worth $350,000. Smith's adventure began at a construction site where he somehow managed to hotwire the excavator and drove off with it. It's not every day you hear about someone hotwiring an excavator, but Smith wouldn't be a true Florida man if he didn't. His awesome trip took him down several roads where he collided with buildings, fences, and light poles. Seriously, who doesn't want to do this? At a nearby storage unit center, Smith extended the excavator's boom to inflict additional damage, damaging or destroying four buildings owned by the storage company. However, the most astonishing part of Smith's destructive journey was yet to come. He made his way to a Walmart where the situation took an even more absurd turn. Smith plowed the massive excavator into a loading dock wall before crashing it into the south side of the store, causing extensive exterior damage. Then, after ramming the Walmart with a stolen excavator, Smith fled the machine and ran inside the store wielding his machete. He must have been chopping down those high prices. But his brief reign of machete mayhem didn't last long as he quickly discarded it. When law enforcement arrived at the scene, Smith told the police that he was on, well, let's call it fun stuff. We know you probably just assume that a Florida man would hotwire an excavator and drive it literally into Walmart completely sober, and we hope you learned a valuable lesson about assuming. Smith was charged with six felonies, including first-degree larceny, grand theft causing damage to property estimated over $1,000. Additionally, he faced four third-degree felony charges for criminal mischief and a felony charge for armed trespassing, along with a misdemeanor for resisting an officer. But for one brief, shining moment, Jesse Smith lived the dream. Number three, over and over again. 
Former Premier League striker Niall Ranger was sentenced to eight months in prison after admitting to online banking fraud. The soccer star, who was playing for South End United at the time of his sentencing, pleaded guilty to charges of conspiracy to defraud by obtaining bank details and transferring money. The court heard that Ranger had conspired to use the bank details of Diane Bloss in order to move 2,090 pounds from one account to another. Co-conspirator Ashani Duncan from Enfield, London, received the same sentence for the same offense, while Rianne Morgan, also of Enfield, avoided prison due to a lack of evidence against him. Ranger's life and career have been marred by controversy and legal issues. In 2007, he spent 11 weeks in a youth offenders institute for his part in an armed robbery while a member of Southampton's youth setup. In 2011, he caused outrage by posing with a gun, and in March 2012, he was fined £6,000 for making, let's just call it, unsavory comments on Twitter. Then, in October 2012, he was convicted of roughing up two police officers and given a conditional discharge. Despite these legal troubles, Ranger's career continued, and he played for clubs like Newcastle, Swindon, and Blackpool before joining South End. However, his suspension by South End for non-soccer related manners signaled further trouble. In court, Ranger pleaded guilty to conspiracy to defraud, but denied a charge of money laundering. His defense lawyer, Angus Bunyan, pointed out that while Ranger had previous convictions, the only serious one was over a decade ago. Ranger's sentencing came after a series of incidents that have tarnished his image in the soccer world. His releases from prison back in 2017 included a 7 p.m. curfew, preventing him from playing in evening matches. He was also electronic Tagged. Niall Ranger has publicly apologized for his past behavior, which is a step in the right direction. Acknowledging his mistakes is a positive move towards personal growth and redemption, but as with any rehabilitation process, actions speak louder than words. Ultimately, South End United terminated Ranger's contract due to recurring disciplinary issues further hindering his career. Despite these setbacks, Ranger continued to seek opportunities in soccer, signing with various teams including Spalding United and Boreham Wood. We need to remember that just because someone is good at playing a game doesn't mean we should shower them with money and praise. Crimes shouldn't be so easily forgiven and excused just because he can kick a soccer ball. Number two, this story isn't real. Tiffany Gomas, the woman who became infamous for her not real airplane meltdown, is attempting to rebrand her image and regain control of her public narrative. The marketing executive from Texas made headlines when a video of her bizarre behavior on an American Airlines flight went viral. The incident caused a delay for at least three hours, and Gomas was issued a warrant for criminal trespassing, although she was neither arrested nor charged. However, Gomas portrayed a completely different image. She posted a selfie on social media looking cozy and casual with a wide smile and long flowing hair. The picture was in stark contrast to the video that made her famous. In the caption, she probably stole from one of those signs your mom likes at TJ Maxx. She wrote, One moment doesn't define you, but it can define your purpose. This positive and empowered persona seemed to be resonating with some people as the post received thousands of likes and comments. Based on one picture and one post, fans praised her transformation with one user calling her Woman of the Year 2023 for some reason. Others were amazed at the difference between the crazy plane behavior and the nice looking woman in the selfie. At least Gomez wasn't shying away from her airplane meltdown. She teased a new website and posted a video where she called herself the crazy plane lady. Hey, Tiffany Gomez, probably better known as the crazy plane lady. In the video, she hinted at a journey of promoting positive mental health and standing up against cyberbullying. While the details of her upcoming project remained unclear, it was evident that Gomez embraced her newfound recognition and was using it as a platform to inspire and uplift others. In her first interview since the incident, Gomez talked about how her life changed since the video went viral. She acknowledged the fear and uncertainty that came with her newfound notoriety and urged the public not to judge her too quickly. She emphasized that no one knew the full story and that inaccurate information had circulated in the media. It's worth noting that many people have supported Gomez throughout this ordeal, recognizing that she might have been under the influence when the incident occurred. Rather than vilifying her, some viewed her as a relatable figure who took accountability for her actions. Gomez's willingness to address her behavior and attempt to transform herself into an advocate for positive mental health is earning her sympathy and admiration from a growing number of individuals. So at least she's trying. All of these celebrities are a product of us though, so as much as we loathe everyone in this video, aside from Jesse Smith, who was just living his best life, we need to remember it's our own fault. Until we stop propping up terrible people and giving them attention and money, it's only going to get worse. Number one, pure evil.
In a deeply disturbing incident, a retired California police chief, Andreas Probst, met a tragic end in Las Vegas while enjoying his morning bike ride. A then 17-year-old Jesus Ayala, accompanied by his friend Zemir Keys, intentionally hit Probst with his car. All this happened while Keys was idiotically recording the entire chillingly heartless act. The video, which was widely circulated on social media, showed a callous disregard for human life. As the car approached Probst, who was riding on the side of the road, Ayala and Keys can be heard swearing at other motorists. With chilling nonchalance, Ayala, encouraged by his friend Keys, drove directly into the bike lane behind Probst. He honked the horn and then deliberately collided with Probst's bike, sending him hurtling through the air. As Probst lay motionless on the roadside, Keys continued filming. Ayala then sped away from the scene, leaving Probst critically injured. Tragically, Probst, age 64, succumbed to his injuries at University Medical Center. The shocking video evidence led to the arrest of Ayala, who initially faced hit-and-run charges, but was later charged with murder due to the intent displayed in the video. The cruelty shown by these teenagers is beyond comprehension. To deliberately target a random guy enjoying a bike ride and then video his suffering is a testament to the disturbing mindset of Ayala and Keys. And weirdly enough, Keys' mom had the strange take of saying that her son's side of the story will be told and the truth will come out and not the inaccuracies the media will try to portray. Um pretty sure the actual video, which we're not going to show, will be telling the truth here. Cue up the classic, he didn't do nothing meme. And until we can stop rewarding these idiots who do terrible things for views, terrible stuff like this is going to continue to happen. Who are a few of the most entitled people? Let's get right to it with... Number six, the classic influencer versus hotel. A Dublin hotel owner banned social media influencers after L. Darby asked to stay at the hotel for free in exchange for publicity. Darby, who had 80,000 followers, outraged Paul Stenson, the owner of Dublin's White Moose Cafe, when she asked for a free stay in exchange for promotional vlogs and Instagram updates. Stenson posted his feelings about the situation on Facebook, asking who would pay the staff that looked after the influencer. He also said that rather than receiving payment, he should just allow staff to be featured in Darby's video instead, demonstrating that he clearly doesn't understand social media. Although Stenson didn't mention Darby by name, he attached a screenshot of her email, the only mature thing he did while handling this. In the email, Darby claimed she stayed for free at Universal Studios, which was a great business decision for the theme park. They were probably suffering until Darby's rescue. Online users identified Darby as the influencer in Stenson's post, prompting her to make a video to explain her side of the story. Darby Dramatics complained about Stenson's cruel treatment and claimed he stole her dreams. Darby said she was embarrassed and humiliated by the whole ordeal. The video received 240,000 views. Members of the blogging community supported her and called out Stenson as being unprofessional. Stenson proved his critics right by posting a spoof video on YouTube that mocked influencers like Darby and gave a false apology. He sarcastically said that he should have thought about influencers more. He then added that the more people speak about the hotel to their followers, the more people would hear about the hotel and its brand demonstrating that he doesn't really understand marketing either. Stenson decided to ban influencers from the business since he was probably inundated with them and their sense of entitlement was too strong. He posted on Facebook that he didn't want to deal with the nastiness and drama of working with bloggers. He further warned that you just can't trust influencers since they'll say anything they're paid to, which is totally different from regular advertising where you can trust everything. There's nothing more special than a grown man bickering with an entitled teenager online over a hotel stay, right? Number five, the DoorDash devil. A DoorDash driver refused to give a man his food when he only tipped her $8 because this queen knows her worth. In ring camera footage, the driver yelled at the man for the low tip after she went on a 12 and a half mile trip to deliver the food. She said he must not have realized how far she went to get the food, which is obviously something he should have been worrying about. The woman explained it took her 40 minutes to drive from Smithtown to Comac, Long Island. The customer said it should have only taken 15 to 20 minutes, needlessly carrying on the argument. Not that we would have been better, but still. Always 
be careful when arguing with an idiot. The woman demanded that he do the drive to see how long it took, which is stupid for a variety of reasons. The guy then said he didn't understand the issue, saying he gave her an $8 tip, which is pretty good. She demanded that he adjust the tip, which he did not. She then threatened to return the food, not thinking how long it would take her to return it, and began to walk away from the doorstep. The man posted the video to YouTube where people slammed the driver. Some called for DoorDash to fire her, and others found her attitude shocking. It seems she must have forgotten that she signed up to be a driver. It's not like the guy called her up asking for a favor. Number four, no easy pickoff. Anthony Bass heavily criticized United Airlines after a flight attendant allegedly made his pregnant wife get on the floor to clean up the mess his young two-year-old daughter made. At the time, Bass played for the Blue Jays and made $3 million in just one season. He had made 73 total appearances in his previous season with the Marlins and Blue Jays and had a 1.5 ERA with 73 strikeouts in 70 and a half innings. If you don't understand baseball stuff, the guy was pretty decent. In his MLB career, he's pitched for the Astros, Padres, Cubs, Mariners, Rangers, and Marlins. Someone with such a high profile was bound to get a lot of attention when he tweeted about how the flight attendant forced his wife to clean up after their daughter. Bass expressed outrage that his pregnant wife, who was traveling with their five and two-year-old kids, had to get on the floor to pick up popcorn after his youngest spilled it. Bass's rant wasn't met with the sympathy he expected. When a user asked him who he expected to clean up his children's mess, he said it should be up to the cleaning crew who are paid to clean the plane when everyone leaves. Another reminded him, since he had so much money, he should have a maid travel with him and his family. The user also also accused him of being the reason why people had to pay more for airline tickets and that he needed to take responsibility and not raise his children to blame others for their mess. It sounds like Bass was fishing for some sympathy, but no one took the bait. Number three, the most deserving. Serene Warren took legal action against her estranged family to get more access to their billion-dollar fortune. Warren's father, Ken Evestad, bought Upshur Smith Pharmaceutical Company in 1969. Over the years, and with the help of his son Mark, he turned the organization into a $1.1 billion giant. Unlike his children, Evestad had humble beginnings. He trained as a pharmacist before purchasing the pharma firm $1,500. The firm expanded over the years, and its growth accelerated when Evestad's son Mark took over as CEO in 2000. Mark had quadrupled the company's value by the time the firm sold in 2017. Warren was furious at her brother's earnings from the sale and felt entitled to more money than she received as a result. Three years before the sale in 2014, Evestad rewarded Mark for his hard work by giving him extra stock. Warren thought it was unfair that her brother received the additional stock, but it was just the beginning of the bad blood between the two. Warren eventually cut off all communications with her family in 2016, and by 2017, when the firm sold, she wanted to sell the firm as as well to establish financial independence. Warren had owned 25% of the organization at the time, valued at a quarter of a billion dollars. Despite being a stay-at-home mom and the massive growth the company experienced under Mark's leadership, Warren was furious that her father and brother made over $75 million in bonuses. Although Warren had received over $328 million throughout her life from her parents, she decided to sue her family in 2018 over the bonuses. She argued that the amount her father and brother received reduced the firm's value and her stake in it. And why shouldn't she get more money for the work she did not do and had nothing to do with? An independent auditor disagreed with Warren, finding the bonuses were fair and that, given their impact on the pharmaceutical company, they had been underpaid for years. So Warren entered a five-year legal battle with her father and brother. Even her father battling a terminal illness wasn't enough to make Warren drop the case. This story is all the more heartbreaking because while he was very close with his son, who followed in his father's footsteps, Evestad still very much doted on his daughter Serene. He even named his celebrated vineyard in Oregon and popular tourist destination Domain Serene after her. Tension continued when Evestad passed away in 2020 at the age of 77. Warren lived with her family in a $3 million, five-bedroom, five-bathroom mansion. Her husband Chris hadn't had a job since 2004. Judge Ken Wall highlighted in court that the couple's career decisions meant they didn't have the necessary business skills and knowledge that Mark, Evestad, and Warren's mother Grace had. The judge failed to find proof that Warren's estranged family defrauded her, but acknowledged that it was understandable why some decisions caused her frustration. He also pointed out that any disappointment Warren felt over missing out on her massive inheritance and hundreds of millions in shareholder distributions would be due to her decisions during the litigation process. While the family offered her a $150 million settlement, she 
chose to take the issue to court. In 2023, the judge awarded her a fraction of that amount at $41 million. He also ordered that she cover her legal fees. Serene must have never heard the story of the greedy monkey who was trying to grab too many nuts out of the jar. It's crazy how, after 2,500 years, Aesop is still relevant. Number two, a swift scam. TikToker Marissa Lafada slammed SeatGeek, who she accused of scamming her out of Taylor Swift tickets. Listen to the story and then give your opinion. The influencer, known on TikTok as Marissa Bella, told her 900,000 followers about how she was scammed. However, according to SeatGeek, she didn't tell the whole story. Lafada purchased four tickets for Swift's Eras Tour from a woman on Facebook, and the seller transferred the $500 tickets to SeatGeek. Sites like StubHub and SeatGeek sold tickets to the highly anticipated Eras Tour for over $2,200 and scammers took full advantage of fans looking for cheap tickets. Lafada emailed SeatGeek after she accepted the tickets to confirm they were legitimate. When the site confirmed the seats were valid, she flew from Florida to New Jersey for the show, bringing her young children for the trip. When she arrived at the East Rutherford Arena, workers told her and her friends that someone had scammed them. Lafetta repeatedly called SeatGeek to see if they could give her and her friends other seats, even in the nosebleed section, to compensate for the situation. She claimed she called 50 times and that they repeatedly hung up or pretended they couldn't hear her. Lafada took to TikTok to broadcast her ordeal, claiming the website scammed her and threatened that it would get canceled. SeatGeek reached out to Lafada directly and offered her a $500 credit. She responded that there was nowhere to buy a ticket for that price on their website. Then they offered her $5,000, which still wouldn't cover four Taylor Swift tickets. In her rant, she said that the ticket provider kept offering less than they would need to buy new tickets, meaning they would still have to put in their own money if they wanted to go. Another ticket platform, TickPick, gave Lafada and her friends three floor tickets for an upcoming show. She updated SeatGeek to say that TickPick gave her tickets, and SeatGeek responded that they could send her some too. Lafada demanded the $2,000 back she had paid for the original four tickets. With the publicity the incident received, SeatGeek made a statement where they clarified that Lafada bought the tickets through social media and not directly on their site. However, they did acknowledge that their customer service agent thought Lafada was a SeatGeek customer even though the tickets were fraudulent. So who is at fault here? Lafada didn't buy the tickets through SeatGeek, but they did verify the validity of the ticket. Did she take enough reasonable steps to ensure she wasn't being scammed? Was SeatGeek actually responsible here? Number one, the road jump out. Christina Chambers, the wealthy wife of a Texas trader, tried to blame the road's conditions when she hit a pedestrian while driving intoxicated. After meeting on OkCupid, OK Joseph McMullen was on a first date with Brianna Itcherino. It was a Tuesday night, although they initially discussed meeting on a Friday, as there was a karaoke event that Tuesday. To us, that sounds like a bad idea for a first date, since we definitely can't sing, but good on Joseph for diving in, right? The couple spent the evening singing karaoke and planned to end it at a nearby donut store. McMullen asked Itcherino if she wanted to drive, but they decided to walk as it was a pleasant evening and their destination wasn't far. The two were walking on the sidewalk when they noticed a car flying down a narrow road. Although Ichirino contemplated hopping into the parking lot they walked alongside, everything happened too quickly to act. Christina Chambers was driving her Porsche so quickly that she missed an upcoming curve and hit McMullen. The force of the luxury car threw his body 30 feet from the wreckage. People came to McMullen's aid while Itcherino called 911, who told her to perform CPR as he had a very faint pulse at the time. When emergency crews arrived, passed away. Chambers hit a post and broke her leg and clavicle. She had a male passenger in the vehicle who didn't suffer any serious injuries. Officers arrested Chambers for driving under the influence. She arrived at her court date in a wheelchair, still recovering from the injury injuries she sustained in the crash. Her lawyer, Mark Thiessen, said she wasn't guilty because of the poor road conditions on Houston streets rather than the fact that she drove 100 miles per hour while intoxicated. You have to wonder how ridiculous he felt actually saying that after someone passed away. Although Chambers told the police that she drank one beer hours before the accident, she had four times the legal limit in her system at the time of the crash. They also found traces of Adderall and another illegal powdery stimulant. Thiessen stated that his client, who lived in a one and a half million dollar home, was unemployed and relied on her husband as her sole provider. Life must be rough for her. The judge set her bond at $50,000 and prohibited her from driving unless she got a job. She also had to install a landline at her home to ensure she abided by those conditions. Who are some people who made the most out of their career move? Let's get right to it and start with number five. Catch me outside. How about that? Danielle Brigoli achieved fame practically overnight after a Dr. Phil appearance where she uttered her infamous catchphrase, Cash me outside, how about that? 
Rigoli was 13 when she appeared on an episode of the Dr. Phil show where her mother spoke about her daughter's outrageous behavior. Behavior that the American audience subsequently rewarded her for. After her appearance, Rigoli attended a school for troubled teens on a ranch in Utah, but she quickly returned to her old antics when she got home, surprising everyone. A year after her appearance on the show, Rigoli was in a juvenile court pleading guilty to charges of grand theft, marijuana possession, and filing a false police report. She stole her mother's car and purse and told police that her mother had been using Rigoli spread powdered sugar on a bathroom counter and reported it to the police. Authorities caught her in a car with marijuana as well, leading to her being arrested. When she appeared in court in Palm Beach, she burst into tears. A representative from the Juvenile Department of Justice acknowledged that there was a significant change in Brigoli, who was remorseful for her actions. Her father, Berta Peskowitz, is a sheriff's deputy in Palm Beach and expressed concern that she was being forced into these actions and was worried about who was profiting from Brigoli's activities. After pleading guilty, Brigoli received five years of probation. Peskowitz wanted her to complete her probation in Palm Beach, but the judge allowed her to do it in California instead. She also had to take courses in sexual education, anti-theft, and domestic violence. Additionally, she had to participate in 100 hours of community service and was given a curfew of 5 p.m. to 6 a.m. That same month, she announced that she would be launching a rap career. Her first single was partially leaked by TMZ, where she bragged about her fame and fortune. She used the stage name Bad Baby. Five years after she was on Dr. Phil, Rigoli bought a $6.1 million Florida mansion in cash. The home was 9,200 square feet and had seven bedrooms and seven bathrooms. She was 19 when she purchased the property, which sat on one acre of land and had a two-story guest house. It had many luxurious amenities, such as a pool, an eat-in chef's kitchen, top-of-the-line appliances, a primary bedroom with three large walk-in closets, an outside jacuzzi area, and an ensuite with a walk-in rain shower. The home also had a billiard club room, a wine storage space, and a dry sauna. It was Brigoli's second home. The first house she owned was a five-bedroom, seven-bathroom estate in the same neighborhood as the new one. Brigoli has several streams of revenue. Her manager, Adam Kluger, helped her land multi-million dollar deals and set her up to work with Atlantic Records. She has brand deals with online retailers like Copycat Beauty and Fashion Nova and launched her own indie music label. Her music was streamed over one and a half billion times, and in 2017, she was the youngest female rapper on the Billboard Hot 100. Brigoli's other source of income was her OnlyFans account, which she started when she turned 18. In her first six hours on the platform, she earned $1 million, breaking a record. Despite keeping the amount she earned for her photos and videos on the platform quiet, she admitted that she would never have to worry about money again. Unfortunately, life wasn't perfect for Rigoli. She dealt with childhood trauma and suffered from prescription pill abuse. In June 2020, she went to rehab and completed a 30-day program. In August 2022, six years after Brigoli's 2016 appearance on The Dr. Phil Show, she announced she would launch a scholarship. She wanted to help others create their paths to success as she had. She partnered with EduCapital Foundation and created the Bad Scholarship Award. The $1.7 million scholarship was designed to help enroll students nationwide in technical and trade schools. Recipients of the scholarship would have the opportunity to learn about various professions ranging from the business of special plants to cybersecurity to cosmetology. She hoped to help people become educated in these trades despite not having the money to do so on their own. Each recipient would receive $1,000 toward their trade school education. On top of that, 50 graduates would receive $10,000 in startup capital, enabling them to launch their own business. Brigoli also planned to handpick graduates that would receive full ride scholarships. In another life, she could have seen herself as a nail technician where her interest in trade schools began. As well as continuing to work on her music, Brigoli eventually hopes to open more of her own businesses, one of them being a nail salon. She likes the idea of opening a franchise so that she could have salons in different areas. Brigoli attributes her success to being strong-willed and working hard and hopes she could empower others to do the same. It definitely wasn't because of America's appetite for watching train wrecks. It was her strong will and notorious work ethic. Number four, Matthew Flamini. 
Matthew Flamini is a successful French soccer player who's played on some of the best teams in the world. However, Flamini's true fortune came when he founded GF Biochemicals, a company working towards revolutionizing the energy industry. Soccer fans know Flamini as a midfield player that played for Arsenal, Milan, Crystal Palace, and others. He represented his country in international games, but he had another passion that would soon be his focus. In 2008, Flamini teamed up with his business partner, Pasquale Granada, to work on mass producing levulinic acid. Their goal was for their product to become a sustainable alternative to oil-based products. Levulinic acid could replace petroleum in all forms and have other uses that could forever change the way that plastics, fuel, cosmetics, food preservatives, and even pharmaceuticals are produced. Flamini's vision was to lessen the environmental impact of oil-based products. Those products pose a significant risk to our planet and contribute to global warming, ocean acidification, and rising sea levels. Through years of research, GF Biochemicals figured out a way to mass-produce levulinic acid on an industrial but cost-effective scale and patented their method. Flamini was heavily involved in the bio world and sustainability community. He helped create BioCircle, the first master's degree dedicated to promoting bioeconomy education in Europe. He also co-founded the world's first e-magazine devoted to eco-sustainability. GF Biochemicals increased its investment in the biochemical industry in 2016 when it acquired Segetis. At the time, Segetis led the production of levulinic acid derivatives in the United States. The amount GF Biochemicals paid for the company was never released, although it likely came at a high price. However, the acquisition meant that GF Biochemicals gained the company's assets and intellectual property. Segetis had over 250 patents for plastics, biopolymers, personal care products, fragrances, agricultural chemicals, adhesive strips, and household and industrial cleaners. Following the acquisition, Position, GF Biochemicals was able to produce a much wider range of bio-based products, and this was the beginning of significant growth for the organization. GF Biochemicals' next move was to partner with American Process Inc., an organization that operated a Georgia-based biorefinery where they produced cellulosic sugars. They made the sugars by extracting them from grass, plants, and wood, and were able to use them to create levulinic acid, making them a tremendous asset to GF Biochemicals. Together, the company's plan to build a cellulosic biorefinery to expand the production of levulinic acid from 10,000 tons a year to 200,000 tons a year. Together, the company's plan to build a cellulosic biorefinery to expand the production of levulinic acid from 10,000 tons a year to 200,000 tons a year. The partnership with American Process helped steer the company toward the next step in its strategy. They spent a lot of their early days proving they could produce levulinic acid at a competitive cost to their oil-based competitors. As for Flamini, GF Biochemicals' growth steered him towards becoming a billionaire, with the company on track to make billions. Number three, Cabby Lame. Cabby Lame dethroned TikTok superstar Charlie D'Amelio when he overtook her number of followers in July 2022. Lame moved from Senegal to Italy and worked at a factory until he was laid off in 2020. Following the loss of his job, he began making funny videos. Unlike many other influencers on the platform, Lame's videos had no words. He relied on his facial expressions to make people laugh, and they did. Because Lame's content didn't have a language barrier, he was able to amass a global audience. As of January 2020, 23, he had 153 million followers, a number that has steadily grown. Not only did he become one of the app's most popular performers, but he also became a multi-millionaire. Endorsement deals with brands like Hugo Boss and Pepsi helped take his career to the next level. In 2021, he joined the gaming world and made a commercial for the Xbox Series S in his unique comedic style. Other brands that monetized off his international fame were Netflix and the fantasy sports platform Dream 11. His content was used and ads for Instagram and TikTok. While his popularity made him very wealthy, the cost of producing his content stayed low. His innovative videos were small budget productions, making it easy for him to keep making them and profit along the way. Unlike others on the platform, Lame stayed true to his roots and continued producing the material that made him successful. He has never said a word on the platform and has amassed an estimated $15 million net worth, all from just doing a simple motion that gets everyone to relate. Number two, no more school.
A former high school teacher became a millionaire after ditching the classroom and turning to OnlyFans for her income. Courtney Tilia was once a special needs educator in Arizona and struggled to support her family. She was in her early 30s when she knew that something had to change and found an unconventional way to rapidly increase her income when she started sharing explicit content on the popular platform. After three years, she was raking in millions of dollars from her accounts. She managed three accounts, one that has a VIP page, a free page, page and a merchandise store. The VIP page was her most profitable, bringing in roughly $380,000 in monthly subscriptions. She's also made hundreds of thousands of dollars from messaging fans, as customers would tip her for performing requests, the one she's willing to do, of course. No longer tied to a teacher's salary, she started enjoying solo vacations to Colombia and Jamaica, and family getaways to Hawaii and Nashville. She didn't just spend her earnings on herself, though, as she frequently donates money to homeless shelters across Los Angeles. Tilia decided to leave teaching in 2016 when she was so stressed about money that she began to hate her job. She also became depressed as the financial struggles of the job took away her enjoyment. As a mother of four, she had her family to worry about. If she hadn't stopped teaching, she would have had to wait 25 years to make the money she made through her OnlyFans accounts. Tilia's situation was nothing new for teachers who have seen their salaries decline over the past decade and are often underpaid. Once she gained financial freedom, she could do the things she'd always wanted to do and is happier than ever. Tilia doesn't feel shame over over her newfound career and has her family support for her change in occupation. As well as being an OnlyFans model, she started a life coaching business where she helped other women emulate her success. Her focus was to remove any guilt or shame over embracing their sultriness. Tilia wanted to create a safe environment where the women felt comfortable enough with themselves to feel free to express themselves. Her clients live worldwide, including the US, Australia, and Europe. Ultimately, her goal was to make others feel as free as she did by helping them change their lives and gain financial independence. Number one, turning blonde. Sometimes making a lot more money doesn't take too much effort. And in this case, it only took a change in hair color. A TikToker by the name of Rachel decided to dye her brunette locks blonde and swap her minimal makeup routine for a more glamorous one. Just a simple change of the color of her hair dramatically increased her earnings by more than triple as a casino cocktail waitress. Rachel used to rock a plain and subtle style, but found that customers preferred a more over-the-top image. Not only did she change her hair and makeup routine, but she also revamped her closet. Rachel always wore crop tops and pink attire, but altered her style to have a more bimbo-like appearance. She added corsets that cinched her waist and accentuated her figure. Following the makeover, Rachel made much higher tips, averaging around a $5 tip per drink. She could sell up to 70 drinks during a shift, and her annual earnings were between $80,000 and $100,000. Rachel spoke out on TikTok about making more than people with college degrees, and that the older generation didn't have a clue how much her generation could earn in tips. Many other users shared similar experiences, talking about how they lost tips when they dyed their hair from blonde to another color, or that their tips went up when they went blonde. They also said that people would beg them to dye their hair other colors, but that blonde was the most lucrative for them in their professions. Some users commented that a degree is better to have as it lasts a lifetime versus working as a server, which wouldn't be sustainable forever. They pointed out that they were once servers, but youth and beauty would fade. But that just sounds like like haters to us. Click to watch one of these next videos. Let us know in the comments below which platform would you rather pick to keep, TikTok or Instagram?